All right. Good evening and welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District November 18th Board of Trustees meeting. I am AESD Board President Paulo McAllis and I call this meeting to order at exactly 5.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically and by means of live video broadcasts on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel for members of the public. Board members and cabinet members will be video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of this meeting. For English, you may connect by phone as follows by calling 502-482-3315. When asked, type in the pin 789-147-278 followed by the pound sign. Para Español, puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera. Llame al 570-6589-322. Cuando se le pida, presione el pin 7 Seis, seis, cinco, cinco, tres, cero, seis, y el simbolo pound. Any member of the public has an opportunity to address the board by submitting comments by 12 p.m. on Wednesday, November 18, 2020, online via an electronic form, as outlined in the public speaker's portion of this agenda. Submissions will be read aloud during the board meeting by the board president or designee. Let's go ahead and begin with the board roll call. Item 1A, board member Wellas. Here. Board member Jackie Philbeck. Present. Good evening. Board member Mark A. Lopez. Present. Board clerk Juan G. Alvarez. Present. I am present and the president, Paula McAllis. <laughs> Moving on to item 1B, public speakers on closed session agenda items. For tonight, there are no public speakers for tonight. All right. So, moving on. The board will now close to, uh, will recess to closed session for discussion and or action on the following items. Can I get a motion? So moved, Ruelas. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Alvarez. Seconded by Trustee Alvarez. Discussion. Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Let's go ahead and go to closed session. See you all in another room. All right. Let's go ahead and begin, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to the Anaheim Elementary School District November 18th Board of Trustees meeting. I am AESD Board President Paulo McAllis, and I call this meeting to order at exactly 6.30 p.m. This meeting is being conducted telephonically by means of live video broadcasts on our Anaheim Elementary YouTube channel. For members of the public, board members and cabinet members will be viewing video conferencing together to assist in managing the logistics of this meeting. For English, you may connect by phone as follows by calling 502 Four eight two three three one five. When asked, please type in the pin, which is seven eight nine one four seven two seven eight, followed by the pound sign. Spanish interpretation of the board meeting is available to attendees. Para español puede conectarse por teléfono de la siguiente manera: llame al cinco siete cero seis cinco ocho nueve tres dos dos. Cuando se le pida, presione el El pin siete seis seis cinco cinco tres tres cero seis y el simbolo pound. Board members tonight, all voting will be done by roll call vote. When motioning or seconding an item, please state your name. For any items being discussed, please state your name before discussing the item. Thank you very much. Now let's go ahead and begin with three A, our flag salute. Dr. Downing, who will be leading us this evening? I will, board president. I'd like to ask everyone right. to please stand. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. Thank you so much, Dr. Downing. All right, item 3B, introductions and roll call. Let's go ahead and begin with board member Ryan A. Ruelas. Hello. All right, board member Jackie Philbeck. 
Present. Good evening, everyone. Board member Mark A. Lopez. Present. Our board clerk, Waji Alvarez. Present. Your board president, I am present, Paula McAllis. <laughs> uh, followed by our superintendent, Dr. Christopher Downing. Good evening, everyone. Followed by our assistant superintendent of Ed Services, Dr. Mary Grace. Hi. Followed by Dina Mellon, our assistant superintendent of HR. Good evening. Followed by our acting assistant superintendent of administrative services, Jesse Chavaria. Good evening, everyone. We also have Iris Camacho, senior administrative assistant. Hi, everybody. Followed by Mary Madrigal and Alina Rogue, our interpreters. Present. We also have Darren Brown and Janice Cato, our technology assistants. Uh, good evening, Janice Cato here. Janice Cato, no Darren tonight. All right, welcome Janice. All right, let's go ahead and move on to item 3C, report of closed session, actions taken. There are none for this evening. Moving on to 3D, adoption of the agenda. Can I get a motion? So moved, Ruelas. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Philbeck second. Trustee Philbeck seconds it. Can I get a discussion? Anybody want to talk about this? Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to 4-A. Special order of business. Uh, we have Wi-Fi hotspot donations. Doug Chafee, Orange County Supervisor. And by the way, the presentations will be posted on the district's website, uh, the Board of Education page, starting tomorrow. Okay, uh, Board President. Uh, tonight, we are honoring Doug Chafee, Orange County Supervisor for the 4th District, serving Anaheim, Brea, Fullerton, La Habra, Placencia, and Buena Park for his generous support of AESD students during distance learning. Supervisor Chafee has worked with the district to identify the needs of families while learning remotely at home. Through the CARES Act funding, Supervisor Chafee provided funding for an additional 300 Wi-Fi hotspots to be distributed to our families uh, to support access to distance learning. Uh, Supervisor Chafee is joining us this evening and I'd like to uh, recognize him and offer him the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you, uh, President McAllis. And by the way, congratulations on being returned to the board. It's richly deserved. <laughs> Thank you. you know, the County of Orange is committed to bringing the digital divide and to bridging, I should say, the digital divide and providing technology access to residents in need. And you have many of those. Internet access is more important than ever during this time of pandemic at school closures. I'm committed to supporting access to distance learning for students and distance learning projects for school districts within the fourth district. The COVID-19 pandemic has driven many essential and social activities online. According to a recent research study, most Americans say the internet has become essential to them during the pandemic and hardly live without it. Concerns over limited internet access are especially prevalent among parents with lower incomes. According to the same study, 43% of lower income parents with children whose schools closed, reported their children having to do schoolwork on their cell phones. We allocated the Residual CARES Act funds to your district and also to Brea, Olinda, Centralia, Fulton Elementary, La Hava, Magnolia, and Placentia, your Olinda school districts, to enable them to acquire distance learning technology based on their respective needs. Nobody asked for quite the same thing. The Anaheim Union High School District and Buena Park Elementary District required and will be receiving mobile high Wi-Fi units to bring internet connectivity to low brand, I'm sorry, low broadband neighborhoods and respective school districts will provide broadband 
for up to 150 users within a 300-yard radius. Thank all of you for the work you're doing, especially during this pandemic. I hope you accept this grant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Supervisor Chafee. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Downing. Well, I just wanted to say uh, before um, the board speaks, uh, we appreciate the ongoing collaboration and support provided by you and your team, uh, most notably Al Jabbar, Deputy Chief of, Chief of Staff, and Supervisor Chafee. Uh, we'd like to virtually present you with a certificate of recognition for supporting the Anaheim Elementary School District students and families through distance learning. And we look forward to giving you the certificate in person. And I know that uh, we have an appointment next week where you're going to provide the funding uh, to our district. So I look forward to that, sir. And uh, I know our board would like to uh, recognize you as well. well. Thank you for that. I look forward to a meeting next week too. Be sure you get the money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Board members, any comments for uh, Supervisor Chafee at this time? Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chafee, uh, for always supporting us and um, for providing our students and families with this um, great opportunity. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you. Trustee Philbeck. Uh, Supervisor Chafee, I just want to say thank you so much for this uh, very significant gift and for also for your willingness to support us and partner with us through education. Um, I Board members, I also serve on the First Five Commission with Supervisor Chafee, and I can tell you that he is just, he works just as hard, he is just as involved, and his office is just as generous in looking for ways to help and make um, the, the lives of, of our community members better. And so thank you for all that you do, but especially we are just thrilled to have this grant and for you bringing it forward for us. Um, it's just awesome. And we're just really, really grateful for that. So thank you for your partnership with us. And a pleasure to work with you. All right, Trustee Lopez. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chafee. Thank you very much for uh, identifying this need that we have and uh, acting on it and advocating for our mutual con uh, constituents. I uh, really appreciate that. And thank you to your staff, uh, particularly Mr. Jabbar, for uh, coordinating all of this. So uh, thank him for us, please. Thank you. I will certainly do that. I think I see him on the line, uh, Trustee Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Jabbar, wherever you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll weigh into that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jabbar. Thank you, Trustee Jabbar. Any other board members? I uh, just want to say we appreciate your partnership. Uh, anytime the county and the district can come together to serve our communities is especially uh, um, uh, amazing, I guess you could say. Uh, we look forward to any future partnerships or grants that we could uh, gather from the county as well. Thank you so much. All right, well, uh, Supervisor, thank you so much. And uh, again, we look forward to further partnership with you. Well, thank you so much. You are in charge of the most formulative years of children. So what you're doing is extremely important. So congratulations to the good work you do and convey best wishes to all your teachers and ask them to stay safe. We will, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, everyone, let's go ahead and move on to item 4B, Measure G and J, Citizens Oversight Committee approved annual report for July 1, uh, 2019 through June 30, 2020. John Orr of COC, Committee Chair. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Orr, let me just say a few words before you get okay. going. Okay, so... I just wanted to share that uh, we have a citizens oversight committee and the purpose and the intent of the citizens oversight committee is to oversee our measure G and J funds and ensure that we follow the wording of the bond and what was promised to our taxpayers. And Mr. Orr is our current chair and every year we, you know, the committee comes before the board to present their annual report. And Mr. Orr will share a few words. I, the, the board has that and your board packet has that report. 
And I'm going to turn it over to Mr. John Orr, who will share a few words and information regarding that report. Mr. Orr? Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yeah, I'll keep it short since you all have it. No need to read it. Um, he pretty much explained what we do. Uh, I do want to say that this type of committee would not work without the uh, assistance of the district. If they didn't take us seriously, we wouldn't be able to do anything. And I and I want to express my thanks to Dr. Downing, uh, also to Azela Vasquez, and to Gloria Lopez, who uh, regularly attend the meetings uh, and provide us with the information we need to keep this going. Uh, and so I am very happy to state that for this year, uh, the district has spent the money appropriately. Um, and if you wish to see it for yourself, you can go down Sunkist and see the construction there, or my favorite, go over to Roosevelt. Uh, that is where my children attended. Uh, and when they first started, it was the exact same as it was uh, 30 years ago when my wife attended. Uh, and that's what kind of drug me into this. So I'm, I'm happy to see all the progress that's been made, uh, especially during this time of troubles that we've had this year. Um, but yeah, they've been doing a great job of uh, making better facilities for our children, um, growing their access to technology, uh, adding uh, fences to protect them and keep them safe. Um, so yeah, uh, just to let people know, we do have a vacancy on the committee. Um, so if anybody out there in the public wishes to be a part of it, it is a great learning experience. Um, and if you have any concerns, it is a great place to get that addressed in regards to how bonds are used and, and what the district does with our tax money. Um, but that's it. If there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. All right, board members, at this time, do you have any questions? No questions, just a comment. Thank you so much for the commitment that you've given us and for the oversight. Um, we, it would not be great if we didn't have that. So um, it's truly appreciated and it's, you're doing a, an awesome service for us. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, John. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Mr. Orr, I just wanted to thank you as well. Um, I know you don't do it for the thanks. Uh, you do it because it's important to you. Uh, you mentioned uh, your children in the district as well. Um, it's your tax dollars, uh, just like it is everybody else who lives in, in the district. Uh, so I want to thank you just for uh, overseeing that. Um, it is that thankless job, but we want to take the opportunity to thank you right now uh, for all the work you've done to make sure that the, the money is spent, the bond money is spent efficiently, wisely. So thank you for all the hours of, of work that you put into that and ensuring that um, you know, it benefits our students and our families. So thank you. <clears throat> Yes, thank you so much, John. Thank you, Mr. Orr. Yes, thank you. All right. Moving on to 4D, California Association. We're on 4D, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, 4C. 4C. Uh, C. 4C. Yeah. Measure G and J bond program update and bond sale process overview. Tim McCarty, Piper Sandler, and company, Isela Vasquez, our Senior Director of Facilities Planning and Construction, and Jesse Chavarria, Acting Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services. Yes, let me go ahead and present for you. If you can just confirm with me if you're seeing the screen. Yes. yes. Okay. So, so tonight, this evening, we're presenting to you examining projects and funding presentation. As mentioned, we have Isela Vasquez, our director, our senior director of, of facilities planning and construction, as well as Tim Carty from Piper Jaffrey, who will be talking in regards to our, our bonds or our potential future bond sale. We are currently in the, uh, in the final stages 
of the modernization and construction of Sunkist School as well as the construction at Roosevelt School. Our objective tonight is to provide you with the information that will support you in your consideration what would be the next projects um, that you would want to see come to realization. Given that the design, review, and approval of a modernization or construction project can take up to two years, we believe that this is the perfect time to share this information with you. Tonight's presentation includes the next modernization and construction projects that are part of the priority projects phase 1B plan that was approved in 2016, as well as information about options regarding the next bond uh, issuance or sale. So I'm going to turn it over now, the presentation to Isela Vasquez. Isela, are you there? I forgot to unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, good evening, uh, esteemed board members, uh, Superintendent Dr. Downey, administrators and guests. As your Senior Director of Facilities Planning and Construction, I am delighted to be here this evening to present to you the status of the Measure G and J bond program. I will begin with walking you through the significant progress of the Phase 1A projects. Then for your consideration and direction, uh, we will examine the Phase 1B project list. Next, our financial advisor, Tim Carty, will provide you information on funding of new projects. And lastly, we will conclude with next steps. You may recall this list from the last time we came before you. Many of these projects summarized on this slide have been completed or are nearing completion. While the state encouraged construction to continue during the pandemic, it was the board's resolution deeming the projects essential that allow staff to move forward with existing projects and implement new projects while practicing safe measures. In the past seven months, we have disturbed, I mean, we have uh, distributed $38.2 million to our contractors and vendors. With the two largest projects being Sunkist and Roosevelt, today, today they stand at approximately 94% uh, complete for Sunkist and approximately 86% complete for Roosevelt. If we can go on to the next slide. You may also be familiar with this slide as it details in the order of priority, the next wave of projects to be implemented per the original 2016 plan. If the board approves, we will continue using this roadmap and with this in mind, I'd like to uh, take a look at Patrick Henry School um, as our next school to be reconstructed as it is the first project on the priority list. Next. Examining Henry School Reconstruction Project. The attendance area map uh, locates the, um, Henry at the uppermost northern boundary of the district. Next slide. This slide is of the existing um, Henry Elementary School site plan as it exists today. As you can see, the layout is a, a traditional finger plan of the 1950s and 60s. The school was built in 1967 on 5.82 acres of land and is bound on three sides with by residential dwellings. And it can, uh, currently has 27 classrooms with an approximate housing capacity of 675 seats. Next. The proposed reconstruction of Henry Elementary School, um, as mentioned earlier, the master plan update contemplates a complete teardown and reconstruction with features equal to that of Roosevelt and Sunkiss, such as a state-of-the-art multi-purpose building uh, with um, technology and an audio and visual system illuminated student learning commons that are positioned to receive natural light by design, a research and innovation center that promotes greater student exploration and collaboration, technology capabilities campus-wide, and as we kindly refer to, a donut-shaped layout to create that added layer of security um, from the exterior environment. With 28 classrooms for grades K through six, the capacity will be approximately 700 seats. Next. 
The estimated budget was developed by our architect LPA based upon 2020 data. So the project, as you see here, is estimated at approximately $63.5 million. Next. Based upon proximity, Harbor Ball is being recommended as the site to serve as interim housing. Next. This is a preliminary, a preliminary project schedule, and as Jesse, Mr. Chavaria mentioned earlier, it can take approximately two to uh, two to three years um, to complete a project. Um, however, the schedule will be refined once we uh, hire on a architect for this specific project. Next. And as mentioned earlier, if we continue to use the roadmap that was established in 2016, uh, we will be looking at adding new multi-purpose buildings to five campuses. Uh, this map just highlights for you the locations of the five schools that were planned to receive the new multi-purpose buildings. Next. Here's the list of schools. Juarez, Franklin, Barton, Laura, and Revere. Next. Once direction is received from the board, we can come back to a future board meeting to present the implementation plan. Um, if there are, are no questions at this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Tim Cardi to walk you through the funding component. Sure. Well, thank you, Isela, and uh, good evening, uh, Mr. President and members of the board. It's nice to see all of you. I'm Tim Cardi from uh, Piper Jaffray, your uh, longtime financial advisor. And what I thought I would do to maybe be helpful this evening is first do a little review, a little walk down memory lane, if you will, about Measure G and Measure J, what we've done, where they stand, and what funding opportunities are available to the district if, in fact, the board were to choose to proceed with some of the projects which Isela was just describing. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, we'll start with Measure G, which of course is our older bond measure uh, passed by the voters in 2010. Uh, the next slide is, uh, I always like to start and just, you know, as we refresh our memories, look at the ballot language, the 75 word question, which was presented to the voters. You see $169.3 million, that's the amount of funding authorized by the voters. And you also see that the ballot language is very broad. You see things like classroom technology. Um, you see everything from plumbing, sewer systems, removing hazardous materials. It's very broad ballot language. Um, but another element that was presented to the voters, which is important on the next slide, is what was uh, presented to voters as the estimated cost of the Measure G bond program. So even though for an elementary school district in California, we can ask for up to $30 per $100,000 of assessed value per election, what we did with Measure G was we targeted a lower number, $19.98. So that per 100,000. So that's our target as we plan for how to utilize Measure G going forward. And you see in all of the blue, it was all, it was 1998. So then this is the snapshot of where Measure G sits as of today. Passed in November 2010, almost 64% of the vote, $169.3 million. If you look at the two bullets in red, we have about $44.8 million left available to us. And if you look at the tax rate this year levied by Orange County, it's quite a bit less than $19.98. It's only $13.32. Why is that a good thing? That means we have room. So if you want to proceed with some of the projects Isela was describing, we have some capacity, and you'll see a little bit more in a minute, we have some capacity to tap into Measure G. So that's a good place to be several dollars below the $19.98. So then if we go to the next slide, we thought we would take an equivalent walk down memory lane on Measure J, the newer bond measure from 2016. 
So again, ballot language, the 75 word question, it was a bigger bond, $318 million. But again, very broad language, acquire, renovate and construct classrooms, facilities, sites, equipment, very broad language. So you can really use measure G and measure J for just about any worthwhile project which you would desire uh, to implement. Um, if we look at the next slide, now measure J was a little bit different, but what you see in blue, we targeted $24 per 100,000 on measure J. Again, not the full 30, but a little higher tax rate than measure G, $24. So then the next slide, where do we stand with measure J? Again, you'll remember it was overwhelmingly approved by the community, more than three quarters of the vote in November 2016. If you look at the red bullets, we have $225 million left to go. And the tax rate this year levied by Orange County, again, a good fact, we're not at $24, we're less than that, $22.24. So I think the takeaway from the little review of the two bond measures is good news that we're under the tax rates that were advertised to the community in both elections, meaning we have some running room if we want to tap in to both G and J and raise some funds. So the next handful of slides, there's a little bit of detail in these, but I, I, I know you'll appreciate it, is the current schedule of bond issuances for Measure G and Measure J to try to answer the question, what's available to us? So if you look at this slide, this is Measure G. What's important here? What I think is important is if you go to the middle of the slide, if you were to want to proceed with some of those projects and we needed money in 2021, we could raise about $30 million under Measure G. And then if you look at the bottom, staying within the $19.98 tax rate, which I use as an immovable and I solve for how much money we can get based on that. Now, I do want to draw your attention toward the top half of the page. We've used 4% year over year rate of change in assessed valuation as a planning tool in Measure G and Measure J. That's been conservative. If you look at where it says 2019-20, the district grew over 8% in assessed valuation. If you look at the current year, 2020-21, we grew over 4.61%. What I'm doing around the state with school districts, just to be conservative, is for two years, I'm lowering the 4% to 2%. Just because with COVID-19 out there, we know it's had an impact on Disneyland, we know it has an impact on the hotels, every school district around California, you know, there could be impacts in terms of property values. So there's no, you know, rule book that says we have to do that, but I thought you, the board, would probably appreciate being a little more conservative, not using 4% for the next two years. So I just throttled it back to 2% and then returned to 4% after two years. So the takeaway here is we could raise $30 million, and I do think that's about the maximum on Measure G for projects. So then if we go to the next slide, obviously what Isela was describing in terms of cost is more than $30 million. So what about Measure J? What's important? What's important, go to the middle of the page again. So for tonight's purposes, I just assumed you might need $60 million more. $30 million on G, $30 million on J. So that's where you see in the middle $30 million under Measure J. But here's the difference. We could go higher on Measure J. Because as you see right now on paper, we have another $58 million draw on Measure J in 2023. We could move most of that forward to 2021 if you need the money. 
So I wouldn't think $60 million is the maximum. $30 million is the maximum on G, but we could probably go as high as $50 million on J if we need it. So there's probably about $80 million or so in additional funding we could get in 2021 if we need it. Same principles, bottom line, the bottom row with, uh, uh, in pink there, $24 tax rate. And the same toward the top of the page, using 2% for the next couple of years to try to be a little bit more conservative, and then returning to the 4%. So I think the big takeaway here is, as Isella is working through with Jesse, the, you know, the costs and the projects and how much money the district has and how much additional funding we may need, there's a good $80 million or so that I would say is obtainable in 2021 uh, if we need it. Um, so a couple of more slides I think here in my section. Um, I wanted to just have us look one more time at assess valuation. So remember I said we've used 4% as a planning tool. So if you look at the last, call it 20 years, this century, at our trajectory of assessed valuation, you can see that 4% is a pretty reasonable figure. And if you look at those four lines in the right-hand rectangle, 20-year average, 5.59%. 15-year average is over four. 10-year average is over four. Five-year average is over five. So I think that 4% has been a pretty good conservative number to use with the adjustment for COVID-19 for the next couple of years. So I thought that would be helpful for you to see. Um, now, I know a question um, may have come up, and it's a good question. Hey, interest rates are low. Uh, is there any opportunity out there for us to save money for taxpayers and refinance any of our older general obligation bonds? So I wanted to just take a minute and address that point with you. So the first slide is we did a refinancing in 2016. It was very successful. We refinanced some of the very old Measure BB bonds, which were in the early part of the 2000s. And we refinanced some Measure G bonds and delivered about $9.2 million in savings for taxpayers, spread out over 24 years. There was no extending of the term. All the benefits went to the taxpayers. It was very successful. So that was done about four years ago. What about now? So if you look at the next slide, we monitor all of the district's debt for you to try to see when there are opportunities to refinance. So if you look at the top of the page in blue, there are some Measure G and Measure J bonds eligible to be refinanced. And they carry an average interest rate of about 3.32%. What are market rates today, right-hand side in blue? They're lower than that, about 2.98%. So you might say, well, if that was my mortgage, I would refi. I would take 3.32 down to 2.98. But there's a little bit of a complexity when it comes to bonds. And that's what's in the red. When school districts issue long-term bonds, 30-year bonds, they promise the investors that for the first 10 years, they won't prepay the bonds. So there's a 10-year non-prepayment period on bond offerings. So for those Measure G and Measure J bonds that are eligible to be refinanced in that upper left-hand blue corner, those bonds can't be prepaid until 2026. Now, that doesn't mean we have to wait until 2026 to refi. So that's the purple toward the bottom of the page. The general rule of thumb is when you get to within about four years of the prepayment date, that's when refinancing start producing benefits for taxpayers. So I think realistically, probably in the summer of 2022, if interest rates remain low the way they are now, 
we should be able to conduct another refinancing and save the taxpayers more money. And we'll continue to monitor this. Um, I know a number of you follow the markets. You know, the Federal Reserve has sent signals that it plans to try to keep interest rates low for two or three more years because the economy is going to be very sluggish getting out of the COVID-19 um, difficulties. So we will keep monitoring this, but at least right now, there aren't any savings uh, available for taxpayers. We got to get a little bit closer to 2026. And I'd say 2022 is probably realistic. So I think, Jesse, did I have one more slide or was, uh, let me see. Yes. Uh, so the last slide, I think in my section, what would be the next steps if we do decide that we want to tap into measures G and J? I think the first thing is the board needs to just make some decisions about projects, what projects you want to do. And then I need to work with Isela and Jesse, figure out how much money you have in the bank for measure G and J, and then how much you need. If we're going to proceed, the first bullet, uh, first arrow there in green, I think we would come back to you, the board, and present the financial plan. How much are we going to borrow? Is it 30 million, 60 million, 80 million? Give you a chance to really sink your teeth into that. Then we would prepare the legal documents, very similar to what you approved in 2019 when we took a bond draw, 2018. There's the normal legal documentation. Then we will secure our credit ratings. Remember, Anaheim Elementary School District has very good credit ratings. And I credit Chris and Isela and the whole team for a lot of that wonderful presentations that were made in San Francisco. Now, of course, it's all virtual. But um, we want to maintain those credit ratings because those help us get you know, low interest rates on our bonds and good value for the taxpayers. So we'll look forward to working with Jesse and, and, and Chris and Isela on that. Once those are in hand, we would sell the bonds and we would fund the projects. So whether that's in the spring, in the summer, you know, it's probably about 90 days from the time we all decide we want to proceed with a bond issue to when the money's in the bank. Um, and we'll move just as quickly as, uh, you know, the district wants us to move. So those were really the slides that I thought I would cover to be helpful. Jesse, why don't I stop there and, and turn the floor back over to you? And obviously, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions or be helpful in, in any other way that I, I can tonight. Dr. McCullough, um, we didn't hear you. Oh. <clears throat> Testing one, two, three. All right, board members, do you have any questions for Timothy or Isela at this time? Um, just to say thank you. It's good to see you, Tim. Um, yes, yeah, good to see you, Jackie, and all the board members. Um, it's hard to believe it was was it six sixteen when we went to when was it when we went to San Francisco? We went to San Francisco in 18. 18. We went in 18. Right. That's we passed the bond in November of 16. Yeah. And 16. then we then took we about a year to plan. And then, yeah, you were part of that. I didn't mean to leave you out. I didn't mean to leave Ryan out either. You were both uh, secret weapons when we had those successful credit rating presentations. Oh, don't Francisco. worry about that. I just wanted to say that that was an experience that I can tell you that I learned so much from that experience going with you and about this whole process. So um, still today, that's one of the highlights of being on this board of, of something that I really, really learned. So thank you for the presentation and Isela and, and Jesse. And actually your question, my question was answered in the next steps because it was regarding as what does it look like for us to decide, you know, um, what we're gonna pull or how much we're gonna need. And so that was very thorough in the steps and that answered my question. Uh, thank you so much. Sure, no, my pleasure. Uh, I had a quick question for you on the, the refinance slide um, because uh, this is something that I was personally curious about. Uh, you mentioned the 2022 date. Uh, right. 
reconcile that for me about uh, if we have to wait 10 years, is there any prepayment penalty to do this in 2022? Or would we just be able to proceed with a refinance at that time if the rates are still low and there would be no yeah. penalties? Or sure. No, Mark, that's a very good question. So the answer is there's no prepayment penalty. What happens is, let's say we did a refi in 2022. What we do is we take the money from the new bond and we put it in an escrow account that pays the interest on the old bonds until 2026 and then cashes out the old investors so that the community is not double taxed. The old bonds go off the books and the community only pays on the new bond. So there's no prepayment penalty. But you know when you start with the 10 year time period Usually when you get to like year six, four years from year 10, that's when they, so for example, we did a lot of refis this year for school district where the bonds were prepayable in 2020, that four year. Point. So if rates stay where they are, I think we can do something good for the community in 20, but no okay. prepayment penalty. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That clears it up. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I had I had one other question for you on a uh, one of the previous slides on the the different series. So series twenty twenty one, and then you said twenty twenty three. Uh, sure. There was a there was thirty million was mentioned for series uh, uh, B in twenty twenty one, and then in twenty twenty three there was a, I believe it was fifty eight million, and you mentioned doing fifty eight million would be feasible for twenty twenty one. Uh, I was wondering if you were talking about moving the, all that 58 million forward those two years. So, yeah, it was this slide. Right. Yeah. Oh, so when you know when we put Measure J on the ballot, and, and similarly with Measure G, we have kind of a preliminary plan for when we're going to take the different draws and in what amount. Now the voters don't vote on that. It's not binding. It's always up to the school board. So right now, just the paper plan, we could do 30 million in 2021. If that's all you needed, we could come right back in 2023 and draw 58 million. But as you think about the projects, if you were to say, geez, we could really use 80 million now, we would take 50 million of that 58 and we'd move it forward and we'd make the Series B 2021 80 million. Now, I recalibrate this every year because it's a function of assessed valuation, right? If we grow at a rate greater than what we've used as a planning tool, we can get our money faster. If we grow more sluggishly, then we have to put the brakes on and get our money a little bit more slowly. So the just the, the adjustment to the paper plan we would make, if you, let's say you said we need 70 million, we take 40 million from the 58, move it up and we keep in that example an 18 million dollar draw in 2023 but then we could always move up money from 2026 so this isn't locked in stone we can always my my job is to really make this fit for your project needs subject to the constraint of the 24 dollar tax rate so if you're wondering gee why can't we get more money faster it's really we want to live within our means, if you will, and try to stay underneath that $24 tax credit. So that's really the governing principle. In all. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't uh, combining all the numbers from Measure G, you said there's 30 million, and then we have the 30 million in red there for Measure J, and then the additional 58 million that you mentioned we can move 50 up. So I was just doing the uh, calculations in my mind, I got 110 million, but I heard you say 80 million total. So. No, 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 you're 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 right. No, you're correct. I okay. I, I didn't I didn't add the G money, so okay. we could get about I'd say a max of about 80 million on J only. Okay. Add the 30 million on G, so the total combo. You're 100 percent right, Mark. Would be a call it 110 million dollars. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I just want to make sure I, I heard it correctly. Thank you. Sure. You bet. All right, board members, any other questions for either Stella or Tim?
All right. Thank you so much, Tim and Asela, for that great presentation. My pleasure. Good night, everyone. Great to see everyone. And Jesse, uh, Chris, to let me know, however, I can be helpful as we follow up and, and proceed. But it's uh, great to see everybody in this virtual setting. <laughs> great to see you, Tim. Great job. And thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, Chris. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. All right. Moving on to 4D. California Association for Bilingual Education presents the 2020 Seal of Excellence Awards to Benito Juarez, Jan Correa, Cabe CEO, Olivia Yaya, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. Cabe Board President and Cynthia Vasquez Pettit. Hey, uh, Cabe Senior Program Advisor, uh, Cecilia Roman, Benito Juarez School Principal. So uh, thank you, Board President. Um, this evening we have special recognition and some very special guests. And as you may be aware, the California Association for Bilingual Education, or CABE, is an organization whose core is centered on developing and celebrating the language and cultural richness and backgrounds of students, their families, and the educators who serve them. <laughs> that provides opportunities for a dual language immersion at every one of our 24 schools, including our new virtual Anaheim Elementary Online Academy. We have a proud tradition of working with Kabe to provide bilingualism and biliteracy to our deserving students. This evening, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Carolina Serna, who is the Kabe Region 3 representative, Cynthia Vasquez Pettit who is the Kabe Senior Program Advisor, and Olivia Yaya, who is the Kabe Board President, and they will be recognizing our own Juarez Elementary. Uh, ladies, I'd like to turn it over to you. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Downey, and other guests. Uh, as uh, Superintendent Downing said, uh, we are all uh, members of the Kabe Board. I represent LA and Orange County, and I'm also a professor at Biola University. Uh, Ms. Jan Gustensen Correa was unable to join us this evening, but she sends her greetings. Every year at its annual conference, Gabe presents the Seal of Excellence Award to schools that exemplify exceptional quality in dual language education that can serve as models for other programs. The California Association for Bilingual Education uh, it has been promoting bilingual education since 1976 and is very excited to be here today to recognize one of these excellent schools. While we unfortunately were unable to honor the 2020 recipients in person due to COVID-19, we are delighted to present one of the awards virtually today. Here to present the 2020 Cabe Seal of Excellence Award, our board president, Olivia Yaya, and senior program advisor, Cynthia Vasquez Pettit. Thank you, Carolina. Good evening, president, trustees, superintendent, Dr. Downing, staff. It is such an honor and a pleasure to be here to present to you the 2020 Cabe Seal of Excellence Award to Benito Juarez Elementary School. Um, I just remember it was a year ago when we were visiting the school site, windy, windy day, and yet the academia that we saw there, the engagement, um, the extracurricular activities that you have with the award-winning music program, you have the robotics, you have the Scholar Stars news, you have how. I mean, it was overwhelming to see all the amazing things that are happening there at Benito Juarez. It's a very rigorous process. It is really difficult sometimes to be able to select, but you were up front the really high quality education where you're not only focusing on the academic but you're focusing on the students as a whole and meeting the needs of each and every one of them when i left that day cynthia and i and claudia we were just in awe to see the 
quality of education, but most of all, the commitment from the superintendent, assistant superintendent, directors, the principal, teachers, parents, paraprofessionals, every single one of you has a key component to make it success. And I know it's not only Benito Juarez, I know it's Anaheim Elementary as a whole. So I really want to pass it over to Cynthia because I know our time is limited and I could just go on and on. So Cynthia, would you just give some remarks before I finish? Thank you. Yeah, yes. Well, good evening, board and Superintendent Downing and Anaheim Elementary community. Good to be here and see all of you all of you tonight. And I also want to say it was such a pleasure for our Kabe team to visit Benito Juarez Elementary. And yes, it was a very cold, windy, wintry day. I remember that and meeting the district and site administrators, all of the dedicated teachers, the enthusiastic students, and the engaged parents and community. And this is the second school in the district to receive this award, Price Elementary being the first. And I understand that, that Superintendent Downing wants all 24 schools to have this award. And so maybe that in the future, we will, we will see that happen. And besides reading the detailed application, highlighting the exemplary program there at the, at the school and visiting all the grade level classrooms, our team was able to sit and dialogue with small groups of administrators, teachers, parents, students, and families. And from these small group meetings, it was, it was clear and evident that there was a consistent sense of pride and sincere, genuine happiness that was felt among all of these key stakeholder groups. And as they shared the highlights of the program that they're part of in the Dual Language Immersion Academy and how this academy has impacted their, their education and their lives. And it's, I'd like to focus on one of the groups that we learned from or about the program with our, and that's the parent group. And as the, school, as the school community and the board and the district leaders and Kabe understand the key to our English learner emergent bilingual success involves strong partnerships with parents and families and kudos to the district and to the school community for providing all of the opportunities, multitude of opportunities in different languages throughout the school year for the families to connect and to be empowered and to lead and build community your Parent Leadership Institute, Parent Learning Walks, and the celebration and recognition of the parent volunteers at Benito Juarez are just a few of the activities and programs that we learned about, and that um, we learned of that go a long way in creating an environment where all students are cared for and supported, not only academically, but emotionally as well. So we were just astounded by what was offered over at Benito Juarez. And I'm going to turn it back over to Olivia to get on with that formal presentation of the Seal of Excellence. Thank you, Cynthia. Well, as you can see behind Dr. Downing, we have the banner that um, was presented and we always also gave them uh, the plaque. And on behalf of the entire board, of the California Association for Bilingual Education. Right now, I want you to imagine you have 6,000 people looking at you. We're in this huge auditorium and they're cheering on you in San Francisco. So Tade is proud to recognize the Benito Juarez PK6 Dual Immersion Academy as a Cabe 2020 Field of Excellence School. Congratulations. Well, we are overjoyed and joined by Principal Cecilia Roman. Uh, Cecilia, will you say a few words on behalf of the Juarez family? Absolutely. Good evening, esteemed board members, Dr. Downing, our cabinet members, and of course, a humongous shout out to all of our viewers out there. I know we have our team members out there and our parents who are viewing us today. I cannot tell you how excited I am for today. Um, it really was an honor to have our COVID team um, here visiting our school, and it was, I remember, a very cold, windy day with our coats, but 
quite honestly, it, it was quite um, an honor to really show you the, the, the hard work and the dedication that happens day in and day out. You know, and, and I remember we visited not just our dual immersion classrooms, but, you know, really a, a plethora of classrooms because it really is a school wide effort when we talk about access and we talk about um, celebrating culture and really celebrating the learning. Uh, we do have such an amazing Juarez learning community. You know, Olivia and Cynthia, you guys hit it right on. You know, we have an amazing group of parents, but, you know, I think the students are the, always the ones that blow me away. They are just so um, well at their, they're so well versed in their ability to to really speak to their learning. And, and to me, that's, that's just really the, the reward, right? To get our kids to be able to verbalize and apply all the different um, strategies and teachings that we do day in and day out. So it's an honor for me to accept this award on behalf of our amazing Juarez team and our amazing Juarez, uh, our amazing um, Anaheim Elementary School District. Um, I could not have, obviously could not have done this without the support really of our entire team from, from our students to our parents, our amazing teachers, um, our site coach, our vice principal, we had an amazing support team at the district. As you guys know, this is not just a Juarez thing, although we are the number one school. Got to do a shout out for us. But uh, we do have an amazing district. And so, you know, from the CNI department with Ms. Viegas and Magali Rodriguez, and of course, Dr. Downing, Dr. Grace, it was really a team effort to, to really showcase, but really show you what a day at Juarez is really like. And, and so what you saw was reality and you got to see so many different things. So. Thank you for this recognition. Our school is extremely proud of the work that we do and we look forward to continuing the work that we do. Um, even through this pandemic, um, we continue to strive to always provide the best. So thank you and on behalf of my team, thank you. Thank you and uh, Dr. McCollis, we would welcome uh, comments from the board. All right, board members at this time, do you have any comments to Kabe? Um, I would like to just say thank you. Um, it's, it's, I'm super excited about this. Uh, when you were talking about imagining uh, being in San Francisco with the thousands of people there in the audience, et cetera, you know, I mean, it, it, it got me super pumped. Um, I remember that day when you were at Juarez and, and the excitement that was there. Um, and it's just an honor, truly. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm an alumnus from Medina Juarez. Um, and I now represent that school uh, um, in my district. And I'm just really proud um, of what able Laura to accomplish. Um, and and uh, uh, Ms. Roman knows, uh, I visit her regularly, uh, just how proud I am of everything that's taking place at that school. Um, and and most of all, of course, the students. Um, they love the learning process and, and, and the questions that they ask and, and some of the things that they they view in both English and Spanish. It's it's really just just amazing, and and I'm just super excited. So thank you, Kabe, and thank you, Benito Juarez, Miss Roman, and for everything that you do um, for that fantastic school. Yeah, I definitely have to say congratulations, Principal Roman. Great work. Please make sure that your entire staff uh, knows that I'm incredibly proud and grateful. Uh, board members, any other? Board members would like to say anything to Kabe or Principal Roman. Uh, Kabe, thank you so much. I know we were supposed to be in Anaheim this year. I'm so sad that we're not going to be able to do that. But uh, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. And Cynthia, it's so good to see you again. Hope you're well. Hope everyone's well. All right. Uh, any other board members? Phil Beck, board member Phil Beck. Um, just thank you so much to the Kabe board for this honor. We are very, very, very proud. It's, it's, uh, and it's very exciting. And also congratulations to the um, entire Benito Juarez school and community because job well done and, and you make us proud. So uh, thank you and congratulations to Benito Juarez. Uh, yeah, similarly, I would like to add uh, congratulations to the Benito Juarez family and community. Uh, I know it's uh, a lot of uh, hard work to get all this work accomplished, but it's all it all pays off in the end when you see children uh, growing up being bilingual and using their skills. I teach uh, some of those students or uh, those Juarez students in my math classes uh, currently. So 
It brings me a lot of pride and joy to see them grow up through that program and see that they're successful later on in a, in a setting that is bilingual. And uh, of course, to Kabe, everything you do to uh, encourage multilingualism uh, throughout our state is to be commended. It's, it's so so important for us to uh, to explain to our communities and our children the importance of uh, ex uh, embracing multiple languages and and valuing other cultures. And uh, I know that you and your board that's the mission that you drive forward, and it is certainly appreciated. So thank you so much for the recognition. I think everything is is pretty much been said by my board of colleagues. But I just want to echo that and thank you uh, for spending part of your Wednesday evening with us and recognizing the efforts of Lita Juarez. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Roman, for all the hard work you and your staff have been doing over there. So looking forward to seeing you guys in person so we can celebrate this uh, once we're all clear to do so. And looking forward to, uh, as you mentioned, many more of our schools joining the ranks. So thank you. All right, at this time, board members, please unmic your microphones and let's clap. Woo! All right, and then we take a break, and then we celebrate. Oh, I miss our board meetings. All right, well, moving Thank on. You, ladies, <laughs> have a great one. All right, everyone, moving on to five A uh, news and updates. Parent leadership groups. We have Laura Houston, teacher on special assignment, uh, and we have PTA treasurer Jesse Alvarez on the PTA Reflections Art Contest. Hello, everybody. I am going to present my screen. OK, uh, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Um, Jesse, did you want to start us off? Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having us today. Um, we're back again with reflections. Um, we, as you know, we were pushing this really hard last year and we wanted to continue the momentum this year. Um, but with COVID, we had to make some um, changes a little bit to um, how we're doing the program. So we decided to take the burden off of the, the units and the teachers and the staff um, at the schools. So we streamlined the process this year to um, be able to have all of our students be able to participate, but without you know, overwhelming the schools. So we streamlined through the district office. Thankfully, Laura Houston, again, a huge support um, to the program. Uh, we would not have been able to even remotely do this um, as well as we were able to do it this year without her support. So we're very thankful to Laura and all of her commitment to the arts in our district. Um, so uh, now we have our Reflections winners. Okay, thank you so much, Jesse. And um, Je and all of you probably know this, that Jesse Alvarez is probably the hardest working volunteer I have ever met. <laughs> she is so busy. Um, thank you, Jesse, for all your work as well. Um, we had 20 schools represented in the contest this year. We had 71 entries. And um, as Jesse mentioned, I asked the students through YouTube, um, I, I did some instructional videos and I asked them to email me directly. So they took pictures of their work. Uh, they sent me their um, films and their dances. And you're going to, I'm not going to play the videos for you, but you have the slideshow so that you can watch them on your own time. But I was just so proud of our students. And a lot of them, you can tell, they took pictures with their Chromebooks of their art and you know, emailed me all by themselves. They had to submit um, seven important pieces of information um, and you'll just get to see. So there's different categories. Uh, here's visual arts. We had um, Zoe A from Patrick Henry School, a first grader. She won first place. And the theme obviously is I Matter Because. And students uh, were required to write an artist statement along with their submission. And this is Emma M, uh, second place for the primary division. And she's from um, Gwynn School. And we have Itzia M from Roosevelt School, first place winner. 
Um, and this was so sweet, Itzia and the many trees. And uh, the tree in the center represents her. So good job to Itzia. Zoe G, a fourth grader from Orange Grove. Um, the kindness mirror, second place. And this is the intermediate division. Jaden G from Benjamin Franklin School, um, first place winner. If you look closely at this, you can see the three holes at the top. He did this on lined notebook paper, which is, uh, it's unbelievable. I didn't realize that until I had the art in my hands. And there is his artist statement, Jaden. And then uh, Kiane H from Stoddard School. She was our sixth grade uh, second place winner. And I will just read the names. I won't um, play these for you, but uh, they are amazing. And um, just I am just so proud. Uh, first place was Lainey S. from Benito Juarez School. Um, I Matter to Dance was her title. And then Evelyn K., uh, a kindergartner, won second place from Jefferson School for her dance. She um, chose to dance at the beach. It's a very lovely dance. And Kehlani T, um, she also danced fourth grader from James Madison School. She won first place. And her dance title is The Island Within Me. Kendra B, fifth grader from Roosevelt School, second place dance. Hers was called I Matter to Myself. And then we had music composition where students were required to actually write their own music. They, they could not um, play a song that's already out there in the world. They're actually composing their own music. This is Ewalani H, a fourth grader from Stoddard School. She won first place. And her song was I Matter to My Garden. And um, she even put her lyrics there. And Luis R, a fourth grader from Orange Grove School, um, won second place. And his song was called Can You Hear Me Read? And then we also had film production, which could be um, animation as well. So it was film and animation. Uh, second grader Yaretsi Q from Thomas Edison School gave us a little um, glimpse into her world at home. Um, I really loved uh, watching their films because as a teacher, I rarely get to see uh, the inside of, you know, what goes on in their worlds. And I just, I'm so lucky. <laughs> so hers was called Experimenting. And Megan L., a fifth grader at Stoddard School, uh, was a first place winner. And um, her film was all about um, how she takes care of her health re related to COVID. And Rachel A., uh, Betsy Ross School, a uh, fifth grader. Uh, her film was Everyone Matters, Even You, uh, second place. Jeremiah S. did a stop motion um, Lego film about bullying. It was just amazing. I cried the first time I saw it. A sixth grader at Jefferson School. And his, his title is I Matter because I can make a change in someone's life. And Sarai S., a sixth grader from Jefferson School, uh, produced a very sweet animation, I Matter because I love myself. And then we had literature, Kehlani H, uh, first grader at Stoddard. And again, you can uh, read these on your own time. They're just uh, wonderful. First place, Edward Rulises B from uh, a fifth grader at Betsy Ross School. Violet A, a fifth grader at Lincoln School, second place. Samantha A, sixth grader at Patrick Henry School, first place. And then we had a tie for second place for the um, middle school group. 
Um, this is Juan E. So he did artwork to go along with his um, literature. And he made a We Matter map second place. And the other, oops, I'm sorry. The other second place tie um, went to Andres G from Patrick Henry School titled I Matter. And we have um, one final entry to share with you. It's Kenley H, a sixth grader at Lincoln School. And uh, she entered the photography category, won first place. And she talks about how she rescued her dog and how she matters um, to her dog. So um, I hope you enjoyed seeing uh, those. Uh, I, I have the greatest job. You know, I get to see so much um, student art, you know, weekly. They send me their art and um, it really gives me a glimpse into their world. Thank you. All right, wonderful. I, I can't wait to watch the uh, videos in their entirety. Uh, all right, uh, uh, board members, do you have any comments uh, to either Laura or uh, Jesse at this time? Great work, so proud. Well, thank you to both Laura and, and Jesse. Um, this is, since my kids were in school, this has always been one of my favorite projects. Um, my children entered it. Uh, uh, when they went to Benito Juarez and it kind of holds a special place in my heart. And so thank you for keeping it alive. Thank you for, you know, I know the effort that goes into this and um, it's really appreciated, even if it doesn't get said enough. Um, it's really appreciated for specifically for this project. I love all the, um, the submissions and, uh, literally yeah when you watch them sometimes there's tears you know it's they're just so amazing so with that i'll also just say congratulations to all of the students both the winners and the participants um great job and um I, I, in a year like this year it's especially appreciated especially appreciated that you kept this alive and kept this going and made it matter and still be of such importance. So thank you and congratulations to all. I just loved, I loved everything. And the categories are amazing. So um, I, you think that, you know, you can take these big categories and the kids, oh, that's going to be too hard to do anything with them. <laughs> and then you just stand back every year. I just stand back and I am literally amazed at what comes out of these students. So thank you. Thank you. And we will be uh, uh, getting certificates and, um, you know, recognizing students at a later date. And we are encouraging the schools to recognize the 48 non-winners, you know, in addition mm. to the 23 winners. Um, yes. Everybody uh, put forth effort and um, yes. Wonderful. All I right. Wanted... Yes, go. Oh, I wanted to add just kind of uh what Ms. Uh, board member Philbeck was kind of getting to, I think a little bit was the idea of how important the arts are specifically in our community during this traumatic time. And as you can tell, some of the students did express themselves artistically through through the, the, uh, the media they sent regarding uh, COVID and how it is affecting them. So we really do appreciate you uh, continuing on this project during this time. I saw firsthand the amount of work it takes to plan that. So. It is truly really appreciated. Thank you, Laura, for all the support uh, you gave PTA during this time because um, they they really needed that support from the district uh, and you made it happen. So thank you so much and congratulations to all the students who submitted an entry. Also, I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for inspiring the youth, uh, for being, uh, being there to foster those talents and be able to help them to express themselves. I was watching uh, the, the presentation here and looking at some of the artwork and thinking, I can't even take a picture that looks as good as some of the artwork that they're <laughs> doing on, uh, on some of these uh, that they submitted on some of the submissions. So uh, I want to thank you for all the time and effort. Um, 
you know, I haven't, I haven't have a first hand or first row view of it like Juan did, but uh, I can only imagine that it's, <laughs> it's a lot of work that goes into that. You always see uh, the glamorous outcome of what it looks like, but there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. Hours and hours, I can only imagine. So uh, thank you again for really helping all those students to be able to express themselves and giving them that inspiration um, and the encouragement and the support that they need to be able to express themselves. So thank you. Yeah, uh, I just to just uh, kind of repeat more or less what my colleagues have said. Uh, thank you both uh, for uh, taking time to do this um, and kudos to all the students who participated uh, as somebody who doesn't have an artistic bone in his body. Uh, I think it's <laughs> amazing uh, that they're able to really uh, tap into their creativity and really just um, go at go at it, you know, so uh, kudos to all of them and uh, kudos to the winners. So all right. All right, board members, let's undo our microphones. Woo! And thank you, PTA. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jesse. All right. <laughs> okay, moving on to association updates. There are no association updates for tonight. Moving on to 5C, district news and updates. Communications and public information. There are no district news and updates for tonight. Moving on to 6 Public speakers, speakers on agenda or non-agenda items. There are no public speakers for tonight. Moving on to seven, superintendent's report and public hearings. Uh, and by the way, our presentations will be posted on district website under the Board of Education page starting tomorrow. All right, let's go with 7A, culturally responsive and ethnic studies task force presentation. Maria Viegas, director of curriculum and instruction and early childhood education. We also have Laura Houston, teacher on special assignment. Well, good evening, uh, school board members, uh, President McCullough, Superintendent Downing, and uh, cabinet and community members. It's my pleasure to join you tonight to be able to share this presentation with you. Joining me tonight will also be Laura Houston. She's our teacher on special assignment for history, social studies, and the arts, as you know. So she's uh, connected to this work. So she'll be my co-presenter. I'll go ahead and queue up the presentation if you give me a second here. Um, and I will start presenting. There we go. And let me present. Oops, I'm so sorry. There we go. All right. Um, if, can you see my screen? You know, once you start presenting, you're not able to see our wonderful panel and so forth. So am I good on the screen there? Yes, you are. Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, again, like I said, I am... Um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to be able to uh, bring to you this topic. Um, we believe that with our most recent adoption of the new history social studies curriculum materials and the instructional shifts in the framework, along with the soon to be released ethnic studies model curriculum guidelines that our partner high school district is um, currently studying and looking at um, their program and how they're gonna implement that. We thought that this is a perfect time to be able to build on the work that has been done to develop culturally and linguistically responsive practices in our district and help lead this work further. So again, thank you for this opportunity to present tonight. So our presentation goals for this evening are to outline the vision we have for the work, um, to uh, describe the charge of the task force, their purpose, a snapshot of the professional learning we anticipate being essential for this work, and most importantly, connecting this work back to students and our commitment to ensure that they are college prepared and, college and career ready. We wanted to begin this conversation this evening uh, share with you by sharing this quote um, from Bell Hooks. She's an American author, professor, feminist, and social activist. Um, because really engaging in this type of work begins with ourselves and authentically being present with our students, ready and willing to hear, see, and recognize all that our students bring to them, whether that be virtually or hopefully someday in person. And just from seeing that presentation of the arts, we can see our students matter so much and they, they have a voice and we want to be able to hear them. So I hope, um, I wasn't going to read the quote, but that you can uh, 
see the connection that it has to the work that we're doing. The quote, the slide here in front of you, um, 15,604, that must sound a little familiar. Of course, it describes um, the number of students that we currently have the privilege of serving in our district. And of course, these aren't certified, these are non-certified numbers by CalPADS, but our, our most recent approximation based on our dashboard. Um, just wanted to bring this back to our students. We know that any work that we do here in our district has to start and begin with our students and that we need to make sure that they're at the center of all the work that we do. This is a snapshot of um, a demographic slide that we traditionally present and include in all the professional learning that we've done in our ed services department. And we thought it captures and it always brings into, into the professional learning the students that we're serving, um, as I said, because we want to tailor and ensure that all programs and services are aligned to support and meet their needs. So uh, again, it should be a familiar slide, hopefully that you've seen in the past. Um, the icons on the bottom give you a snapshot of, of the kids. 84% of our kids are on eligible for free and reduced. 70% of our students come to us as emergent bilinguals, which I think really speaks to their grant, their, to their grit, excuse me. They're not only learning content, but they're also learning English at the same time, which I think speaks about the strength of our students. 95, 94% of our students come to us with a partner language. Um, of our emergent bilinguals comes to us with a partner language of Spanish. Not to mention that we also have um, 33 other languages that are represented here in our district. 9% of our kids approximately um, come to us with um, an array of different learning needs, whether that be on the special education side and or as gifted and as gifted learners. And finally, that 10% represents um, the percent of our students that, that are identified as homeless. So again, always important to ensure that our students are in the room as we talk about our efforts to bring new professional learning. So our goals for this task force um, are indicated on the next two slides. And we envision that they would help us um, build an implementation plan that would bring these goals to fruition. So we have three bullets here. We want to ensure that our task force helps us engage educators in becoming cogniz cognizant of their own culture and how creating intentional structures and inclusive practices impact student learning. We want to um, ensure that we identify and implement curriculum and materials that address equity, inclusivity, and multiple perspective of all learners while promoting the celebration of a diverse school community. We want to create policies and practices that ensure curriculum programs and resources are culturally responsive to all learners. We want to make sure we address Assembly Bill 2016, 2016 Chapter 327 of Statutes 2016 that requires LEAs to implement ethnic studies model curriculum and principles. We want to outline a professional learning plan to guide the implementation and training of the newly adopted history social studies materials for all staff. And lastly, we want to make sure that we're able to use this platform to continue um, those collaborations with the Anaheim Union High School District and ensure that we have cohesive pathways that align to our efforts to support our students. So in terms of this task force, which we've, um, the acronym CREST um, fits very well. We, we envision engaging a diverse group of district and community stakeholders that would include teachers from our History Social Studies Adoption Committee, individuals from our Anaheim Union High School District Ethnic, Ethnic Task Force, parents from PTA and DLAC and administrators. We, would like to, we see ourselves meeting monthly, of course, virtually beginning in February through June of 2021 and continuing as needed. Um, we think it's imperative that with this group, first and foremost, we engage in professional learning and dialogue so that we can develop a shared experience, understanding and common language that, that, that then will guide um, the recommendations of a professional learning plan and an implementation plan to not just roll out the history of social studies, but also those elements of uh, building our, our district um, in, in practices of culturally responsive teaching. 
The three areas specifically that we want to focus in, again, is culturally and linguistically responsive teaching, the ethnic studies model curriculum, and then the history social studies framework. We think these are the three, we can marry these three areas together to really frame the work for our district moving forward. So the next couple of slides here um, provide a brief over, provide a brief review of the professional learning. We would, we would want to begin with a task force through the initial stages of our meetings. As I, as I know that I'm talking to educators um, and who are very well versed in this area, all of the research in culturally relevant pedagogy just emphasizes the importance of looking within ourselves for the first purpose for the purpose of understanding that we and our students are more than just a single identity, but rather a complex mix of identities. And um, we need to be willing to see that all people have culture um, beyond ethnic culture and that because of this culture, um, it, it provides for us the different windows to be able to fully leverage um, our students and the learning for them. So that slide that you're seeing in front of you, um, we thought captured that very well. And again, like I just can't reiterate that I was reminded as we were putting together this presentation, there used to be a quote in the hallway in building A and it talked about, um, it was on the wall. I haven't been there recently as I, I try to stay safe in my own office, but it said the organization cannot be what the people are not. And um, I was reminded because again, this work really begins with some some work of looking internally so that we can be champions of the work for our whole district. We want to really focus on looking on um, taking the task force through a series of activities that would focus on understanding and recognizing implicit bias, also known as hidden bias, and um, how that uh, dwells in all of us, in ourselves, and the impact that it can have on our behavior towards other groups in terms of, you know, our snap judgments, you know, our behaviors for particular social groups, first thoughts and so forth. Um, and how, how important that is again, and also make connections on how that impacts the classroom, especially when, when it comes to management, grading, relationships with students. Um, again, it becomes with a, a self-awareness so that, that we're able to shift and really connect with kids. With our task force, we also think it's important to spend some time um, looking around, looking at and understanding um, asset-based pedagogies. Um, we know that for many years, we've tried to ascribe to this idea that we look at our students as assets and that what they bring into our classrooms every day and into our district are, are assets of culture, language, and not deficits. So it's important that we begin these conversations from that perspective. And as we move forward with looking at how to move this, this work with the task force in, in our school district. Um, what you have here is a timeline of asset-based pedagogies. Um, again, we just think it's important to, to frame the work that we'll be doing and to ground ourselves in understanding the different asset-based pedagogies that have evolved through the years from culturally relevant teaching to culturally sustaining pedagogy, which um, I, I'm, I'm learning more about in all honesty in terms of how we can ensure that, and I believe I heard one of our board members allude to it earlier, but you know, cultural sustaining pedagogy really speaks to wanting to sustain multilingualism and multiculturalism as a focus, uh, with a focus on social justice. And that's something that previous pedagogies didn't necessarily um, focus on. So uh, along with myself and as Laura, as we've had these discussions, it's in, in order to really have a clear vision of where we want to go, we need to know where we're starting and, and understand these pedagogies and have this group engage in um, a thoughtful discussion and understanding the research so that we can frame this work for our students and for our staff.
And lastly, the last slide that I have for you before I turn it over to Laura, I know that, um, again, as we put together this presentation, there's just so much good work to draw from. This is probably another slide that you may be familiar with. It's from the work of um, on cultural proficiency from Mr. Randall Lindsay, who's been an expert in the field for many years, but he, he put forth this continuum that provides language to describe unhealthy and healthy values and behaviors of persons and policies. Um, and when looking at organizations that is wanting, that is looking to do work around cultural proficiency. We, so we thought, we think it's gonna be very important for the task force to use tools such as this to self-reflect, to identify where we fall in the continuum in order to make short-term and long-term goals for this work. And ultimately, um, we would want to, to get to as close to the right as possible, if not exceed that, by moving to even a to a to a culturally sustaining pedagogy, as I mentioned in the in the slide prior. So with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Laura Houston again. She's our history social studies. Um, uh, expert. She's uh, facilitated and led our a committee of over forty five p of over forty five teachers and district personnel to to land on selecting a curriculum that would be most responsive to our students. And we feel that again with the whole, the history of social studies, the the curriculum shifts and the instructional shifts in the framework that this is a great opportunity to be able to to frame some of this work um, and include that curriculum as we do some, some of this work together. So with that, Laura, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Maria. So with the task force, um, I would really want to you know, review what is culturally responsive teaching. And we know that it's taking into account both cultural and linguistic differences and teaching in a way that validates and affirms our students and teachers should be able to tap into and connect to students' prior experiences, their frames of reference, and allow students to demonstrate their understanding in different ways. And it's all about making learning more relevant and engaging uh, to our students. And so what does culturally and linguistically responsive teaching look like? Um, there are many different approaches, as you know, but the most important things that an educator can do is to validate and affirm the home culture and language in order to connect with the student. And it's educators meeting students where they are and bringing them to where they need to be academically. And the ultimate goal is to provide independence when they are ready for success beyond the classroom. So um, looking at the um, ethnic studies uh, model curriculum guidelines, um, even though they are for grades seven through 12, uh, we feel that Anaheim Elementary School District should start building the foundation now. And we hope to collaborate with the high school district as well. And one of the jobs of the task force would be to analyze our current curriculum and identify the strengths and weaknesses according to the guidelines. And we would start by focusing on history, social science, and then also work on our benchmark curriculum. So Assembly Bill 2016, Chapter 327 states that the model curriculum was written as a guide to allow school districts to adapt their courses to reflect our own pupil demographics. And currently in California, um, there are 92 languages other than English spoken. And obviously that's one of the reasons, you know, that we need this. And we all know that a culturally relevant curriculum will have several positive impacts on students, such as greater student engagement, higher test performance, higher graduation rates, and overall, maybe most importantly, a greater sense of personal empowerment. So one of the things that I would really um, make sure to cover with, you know, the task force, but also with all of our staff 
is um, I want to make make them familiar with the FAIR Act if they are not already familiar with it, Senate Bill 48, and how it is represented within our history social science framework and in our new history social science um, SABIS curriculum. So it was it was Pearson that came to be SABIS. They changed ownership. It changed names is basically what it is. So I didn't want to confuse you by saying Sabbath learning, but all of Pearson became Sabbath over the past, um, it happened like less than a year ago. And the FAIR Act stands for fair, accurate, inclusive, and respectful, you know, and it's all about highlighting the roles and contributions of underrepresented groups. Um, and I think it's also important to emphasize the why, like why is the FAIR Act so important? Why was it written? And um, you can see there on the slide, you know, it is so crucial for students to be able to see themselves or see their families re uh, reflected in the curriculum. And it makes them become more engaged learners and feel uh, validation. And the FAIR Act, to take, uh, to take from the bell hooks quote that Maria read, um, the FAIR Act will help us to hear one another's voices, and it will help us to recognize one another's presence. Um, yeah, thank you. And um, I would also, I, I think it's really important to give trainings on the major shifts in the history social science framework. Um, I think everyone needs to be familiar with them. Um, there's this, you know, the emphasis on inquiry and text evidence and looking for bias, um, argumentative writing, close reading, um, UDL, Universal Design for Learning. Um, it all goes hand in hand with the English language arts standards. And then we also have chapter 20, the access and equity chapter, which covers cultural responsiveness. Um, it focuses on support for emergent bilinguals and all of these shifts that you see will help shape how our students participate in the world. So, you know, we, we kind of have an idea of a professional learning plan for staff. However, you know, this will be what the part of what the task force, you know, convenes and discusses. Um, but this is kind of how I imagined it or we imagined it. Uh, first, we would begin, obviously, by looking within ourselves and yes. learning about our implicit bias, also known as hidden bias. I think you can't move forward or do anything um, unless you first address that issue. And um, second, we would take a deeper look at culturally and linguistically responsive teaching. And we would have activities and um, trainings around that. And also, I think it's important to analyze classroom management from a culturally responsive teaching approach because um, that is huge. And um, finally, we would tie in culturally responsive teaching and the ethnic studies guidelines to the history, social science curriculum and um, benchmark. And so um, what you see here on this butterfly are the essential elements of a culturally proficient individual. And I placed the phrase values diversity at the very center because I believe that element is required for any of the other four to be effective in the classroom. Uh, we have to start with that one core value and valuing diversity means loving all people, acknowledging all points of view, and making a constant effort to create a classroom environment that teaches all students to become effective and participating members of a democracy. And at first, I was going to title this slide the culturally proficient, proficient organization, you know, thinking of AESD as a whole. And then I uh, remembered or realized that proficiency begins within the self. And an organization, as Maria stated earlier, <laughs> perfect, an organization cannot be anything that the people are not. And the sentence in green on the right is just there to remind us of why we are doing this. So our ability to educate children in a culturally responsive way will continue to influence their intellectual and emotional growth well beyond the classroom. And lastly, 
I am concluding with a quote from one of my favorite people, Mr. Fred Rogers, um, because culturally responsive teaching requires a lot of love and it is an ongoing journey. And teachers work with an ever-changing community of students with a new group each year and the effort to be culturally proficient has no end. Um, however, the intention must always persist. And so I'll just give you a moment to read that quote. And that is uh, the last slide. Thank you, ladies. Uh, outstanding uh, job, um, Board President McCullough. Wonderful presentation. Great job, Maria and Laura. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, now, I know our board actually passed a Black Lives Matter resolution not too long ago. Uh, will we be incorporating the Black Lives Matter uh, curriculum uh, that is usually taught around February uh, into the culturally relevant and ethnic studies uh, program? Well, that's a great question. I think we absolutely are looking at this as an opportunity to, to engage this task force to get that, that um, authentic uh, feedback of what is relevant and what is essential for our community and our students. And I believe that's absolutely going to be an element that our task force members um, will bring to, to the discussion. So we are as we kind of discussed this, this is such a great opportunity to create this and bring the elements that we think are most essential for our students in our district and and this is and this is one of those so my answer would be yes but we certainly want to um ensure that it's guided by our task force if, if that makes sense it does okay. thank you board members any questions i don't have any questions just a few comments I uh, really do appreciate you uh, diving into the subject matter and uh, actually being uh, open enough to say, hey, there's some more things I have to learn. And that's, I think, where we're all at, right? And it, that's part of uh, what you were all were speaking about, us individually growing so that we can all grow together. And so it really makes me kind of uh, proud of the, our district and how we're approaching uh, moving forward in this, uh, this realm. I also wanted just to bring up the idea of uh, if we maybe we could consider um, now we're starting with the social uh, social studies. If we could consider how we can address this in a multidisciplinary uh, yeah. way as well, um, that would be awesome. So if our children can learn about uh, the contributions of cultures and mathematics and science and art as well, and kind of bring it cohesively into the children, I think it, it would be a, a very uh, good move. But other than that, I, I love where we're heading and I do really appreciate everything that you're pouring into this project and this task force. Thank you so much. If, if I could address Juan's comment about the multi or interdisciplinary um, study. One of the things that Laura's already been working on is, is looking through the new curriculum. And I know that Nassim Mandalia, our math curriculum specialist, has already identified within the math program that we've recently um, adopted, where they have intentionally um, inserted culturally relevant opportunities for kids whether it's with the content or the story they're telling so it, you know if it's a word problem it's not your typical word problem so as not to offend great thank you board members any questions thank you for the presentation it was it was really informative and in-depth. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions? Because I do have a couple. No? Okay. Uh, also, Maria, I'm very happy that you're going to be working uh, with a pipeline with Anaheim Union High School District. I know uh, two of our board members on this uh, in our board are actually on the Ethnic Studies Task Force in Anaheim Union High School District. What a historic moment for the city of Anaheim. Uh, you know, we are actually one of very few districts that are adopting ethnic studies and culturally relevant pedagogies. Uh, I think we're actually the first. Uh, I know San Francisco uh, adopted one the very next day after we'd adopted ours. Uh, so great work. Uh, I think that is very important as a 
former social studies teacher. Uh, it was really sad to see a lot of my students come in not knowing that the contributions of their very own ethnic group not contributed in the United States history curriculum. And I'm happy that we're addressing that at an early age. Um, you know, it's recently I uh, was reading an article with my students at Cal State LA. And <clears throat> we were reading an article about, you know, that big fourth grade project that everybody yeah. loves to talk about, right? The mission project. The mission project. Families, I mean, I was looking online and they literally spend hundreds of dollars developing the mission. You know what I mean? And in the end of the day, that's all they talk about is the architecture. But let us talk about the experiences of not only, uh, but also of native peoples and how they were treated in these mission systems. All right. We must be critical, right? We must not hinder our faults uh, in history. I mean, in the end of the day, we're, we're going to be creating students that just have more questions. Let us be critical. And I love how you also uh, quoted Bell Hooks. I love Hooks. She mm -hmm. is the mother of critical pedagogy in addition to all the other isms like feminisms uh, and other things that she's <laughs> pioneered. But also with that said, in addition to a culturally responsive theoretical framework, can we please also look at critical theory, critical mm -hmm. pedagogy? Uh, yes, it is great to celebrate diversity, but we must also, in, and you did say empower and utilize inquiry, right? But in order to do real inquiry, to create a level of critical consciousness or what we call critical thinking, which is one of our four C's, right? in order to get to that level of critical consciousness or what Paulo Freire calls uh, it is really important that we utilize that framework. So it's not just, I'm gonna sprinkle my culture here, sprinkle that culture over there, everybody's happy. No, there are more things that go deeper than just understanding each other's group. Uh, but I'm excited that y'all are gonna get into this. There's great PDs out there throughout the country. A lot of them are free. Uh, and I'm just so excited for our district right now. So thank you so much. Any other questions, board members or comments? Thank you for right. the feedback and thank you for your support and enthusiasm. I, I think I need to sign up for your class, President McCullis, because I, I <laughs> do you have the cliff notes on that? I would love to. <laughs> You're <laughs> welcome you. anytime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, let's move on to 7B, AESD, School Reopening Update. Dr. Christopher Downing, Superintendent, Tracy Golden, Senior Director of School Safety and Operations. Thank you, Board President McCollis. Uh, we'd like to share with you an update that was provided to our School Reopening Advisory Committee. Uh, this update is going to share with you the preparations that are going on for our planned reopening. Uh, but at the end, um, we are going to share a new caveat that was provided by the state in terms of guidance on COVID-19. So if we could go to the next slide. Just like to begin with an overview of the stakeholder input that has guided our process uh, in regards to reopening our schools. Next slide, please. Um, this is an overview of the advisory committee that has been formed. Um, and again, this committee consists of board members, uh, certificated and classified leadership and staff, administrators, parents, and community partners. In total, over 130 stakeholders participate. Uh, the SRAC meets to review safety guidance. Uh, we take input from stakeholders. We review reopening options and barriers and uh, the committee, as you're aware, have provided recommendations to the board on the format of a safe reopening. Next slide, please. This is a summary of some of the dates that the committee has met uh, beginning in May uh, through the November 17th meeting. And again, the bottom half of this slide talks about the membership. So you can see PTA members, DAC DLAC members, Creativity Council members, Anaheim community members, 24 parent representatives for every one of our schools, uh, AEA representatives for every school, asthma, 
representatives for every school, CSEA representatives for every school, as well as the leadership of our associations. We even have citizens oversight committee members, admin services, ed services and HR staff, and of course, cabinet members and board of ed members. Next slide, please. Uh, our school reopening stakeholder input opportunities just for this school year have included a parent survey, staff survey, LCAP meeting, which also included DAG DLAC leadership, PTA, and of course, meetings with associations that are highlighted here. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is something that we shared with our group and we wanna just share it with the community. The multiple communications that have been provided uh, with stakeholders. And again, it highlights that in terms of just board updates, there have been 51. Uh, communicating with our staff about our reopening, 70 plus. Uh, district leadership meetings, 32. Leadership updates, 46. District parent letters, 41. And uh, there will be another coming out tomorrow. And this does not include the many communications coming from our individual school sites. We have a nurse advisory committee, 17, site administrator focus group meetings, and then two virtual town hall meetings. Something I'd like to showcase as well, as this is a collaboration. You know, we're all in this moving forward together. So we've been working with our associations and the board uh, in terms of all of the communications and reviewing them and providing any feedback or guidance for us. Next slide, please. And now to provide an update on the many safety preparations that are taking place, it's my honor to introduce Tracy Golden, our Senior Director of School Safety and Operations. Tracy. I think you're on mute, Tracy. Sorry about that. All right. okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk about some of the safety preparations that we have um, that are ongoing and that we are getting ready um, to put into place now that we are talking about possibly coming back uh, eventually. So next slide. So we have a district reopening plan. We've updated that uh, so that it is now aligned with the revised guidance that was brought out on August 3rd by the California Department of Public Health. Um, so it aligns nicely with that. And we have already shared that with all of our staff through a staff letter. And we have also shared it uh, for all of our families and we have it available in uh, Spanish, English, and Korean for our families. Next slide. In addition to the district uh, plan, all of our schools have come up with site-specific plans that will be communicated uh, to all of their staff and families. And we've kind of have a timeline for that so that it's not all this information all at once. So principals are now in the process of communicating the safety protocols, uh, some of the procedures, the screening procedures, visitor policies, uh, student arrival, student dismissal, all those procedures that are gonna be very specific to their schools. And they are now holding uh, family meetings and staff meetings to communicate all that information. Next, okay. Um, so as we start thinking about having students return to school, we are asking uh, families to do the symptom screening before they um, come to school and asking that they keep their children home if they have any of these COVID-19 type symptoms. So currently the schools are working with families to understand this symptom tree, which has come out from the Orange County Department of, or I'm sorry, the Orange County Healthcare Agency. And as you can see, it kind of has all those COVID symptoms up at the top. And you know, the direction is, is if your child has any of these symptoms, please keep them at home um, so that we can keep everyone safe. And then below it, it has a lot of uh, different decisions to make depending on what situation you're in. And so the school sites are now working with families to kind of understand this tree and how to make decisions. 
But we also know that sometimes, you know, students come to school and they will get sick at school. So we do have um, a protocol for that. We have um, identified a room on campus. Every one of the principals has done so already. And uh, we have procedures in place to make sure that we keep the staff safe who is um, there caring for students, as well as keeping the students comfortable and safe while they wait for their parents to come and pick them up. And then once the parent comes and we talk through um, the guidelines with them, we help them go through that decision tree to decide when a safe uh, return to school will be for their, for their child. And there's different options for them to do. They can go to their doctors, um, they can you know, go and get a COVID test, or they can do a 10 day uh, quarantine depending on their symptoms. So those decisions are made in collaboration with the school staff and parents. Next slide. Um, we also have protocols in place for when we have a positive case on campus. And you can see there's kind of two different uh, communications that go on, depending on whether it's a student positive case or it's an employee positive case. But in either case, there is a response team, a COVID response team that kind of um, is in charge of kind of directing the investigation. So um, the school site has a response team if it's a student. And then here at the district, we have an employee COVID response team. They do the investigation. So once we find out there is a confirmed positive COVID case, uh, we will contact the employee or contact the parent and start our investigation. That includes um, contact tracing, you know, asking questions about where they were on campus, who they were in contact with, whether it was a close contact, um, you know, within six feet, uh, was everybody wearing masks? So we kind of do this um, pretty thorough investigation. And then we are also required to report all positive cases to the healthcare agency. And once we do that, the healthcare agency uh, collaborates with us and they help us decide what communication comes next um, because it depends on, every situation can be different. So we work with their nurses and their doctors there and they help us with what communication we need to make and also who to make it to. And then those response teams are responsible for contacting all the other people on campus that need to be notified. Okay. Also, um, I know that you have seen this slide uh, before, but just you know, emphasizing again that every person that comes on to any of our district's uh, sites, schools or, or district office, um, are screened. It's a little different depending on who you are. If you're an employee, um, you know, we're going to be using the uh, company nurse uh, screening process, which has a, a registered nurse follow-up triage portion to it. Um, that's pending the board approval tonight. Um, students will be screened at home by their parents as far as symptoms, but then they will also be uh, having a temperature check every time they come onto campus in the morning. And then every visitor that comes onto our campuses is also getting a verbal symptom check and a temperature check before they are um, cleared to come on. All right, next slide. We are also doing a lot to make sure that our classrooms are ready and our school sites are ready. And our goals is to have the schools ready by um, December 11th with all the uh, PPE and safety uh, materials that we need or safety measures that we need to reopen. Next slide. Uh, so with the air filtration in all the classrooms, actually not just classrooms, but all our buildings right now, we have people working in buildings and we have people working at schools. So we have already done all the filter changes and changed out um, the uh, bringing the inside air in. And so we are within the guidelines of the healthcare agencies, but we are gonna be adding another layer of um, protection by increasing our air quality, by using a variety of different things. And I'm gonna have Jesse jump in if I misspeak on any of this, uh, but air purifiers will be um, available in places where they need to be. Um, we have the four ply filters with the, that are gonna be treated so that it collects the, the um, bacteria and viruses, et cetera. And then we also have our Remy Halo LED systems that are coming in and that first batch um, has already arrived and is getting ready to be installed. 
don't know if Jesse, you want to add anything to that, or is that a, a good summary of that? No, that's a good summary. And, and just to reemphasize that we know staff and actually students at the YMCA child care are in our classroom. So we have met that guidance, but you know, just like the board and our superintendent believe in additional safety precautions, this is an extra layer of protection for them. Next slide. Um, we also have um, extra barrier protections for all of our students and our staff. So um, every student desk, actually not the desk, but every student will have their own desk guard. So that will be changed out. So students won't be sharing their uh, guards that are gonna be placed on their desk and those will be completed by the December um, uh, deadline. Also, we have a movable instructional guards and I know you probably have seen those where uh, teaching staff and IAs and any adult in the classroom can use that so they can be mobile in the classroom and move around, but still have that extra barrier of protection. And then every teacher desk will also have a desk guard so that they have an extra layer of uh, a barrier protection. Next slide. For all of our students, we have um, some personal protective equipment that we will be uh, providing for them. Um, every student will get a set of cloth masks, five of them. They will also receive a Chromebook case, which will allow them to take their Chromebook to and from um, home and school so that we aren't sharing devices. Uh, they will have containers that will have their own supplies, and then we will also give them supplies to have at home, again, to reduce um, them sharing or having any communal types of um, materials that they're using and everybody's touching. Uh, disposable masks will be available in case students, you know, lose their masks or, or forget their masks or it breaks during the day. And of course, the desk guard is there to help protect them also. Next slide. Uh, during December, we want to make sure that we get all this uh, PPE into the hands of our students before the holidays. Um, you know, Cloth masks are required everywhere, and we also want to make sure that they're not only using them over the holidays, but it gives them a chance to, you know, get used to them, uh, kind of build up their capacity to wear them for, you know, um, a, a good length of time, kind of preparing them for school. Um, so we want to make sure that that happens. So we're going to do that in December. The schools will have a grab and go, and they will give them their masks, um, their Chromebook case, and any supplies that they need to have at home. Next slide. We also have uh, care packages for our employees that include all of this PPE. Um, again, five cloth masks, a face shield, disinfecting wipes, gloves, hand sanitizer, medical gowns, and a thermometer. And they'll all be in this uh, pack. And this is for each employee to use uh, to keep them safe and to keep them protected. Uh, all of these things can be reordered. So, you know, obviously once, you know, the gloves are gone or, you know, the gown has been used, we do have extra PPE and plenty of it for them to reorder. Next slide. And you can see here, this is kind of just a sample order, but all the schools have put in a, a three month order of PPE. So all of these items will be at the school. So any, any staff member that needs anything, they don't need to wait to go to the warehouse or come down to the district office. It will be there at their school site for them to have. Next slide. We also have um, put into place um, contactless dismissal for our TK and kindergarten students. Uh, our TK and kindergarten students currently or, or previous to COVID-19, um, need to be checked out by a parent. The parents need to come onto campus and, and check them out, and that's for safety reasons. Uh, but in the past, we've done it with, um, you know, a pen and paper. And the office has had to, you know, uh, print out the list of emergency contacts that they could, you know, pick them up and hand them to the teacher. And so it had a lot of um, paperwork and a lot of touching. So now our data team has uh, designed a contactless dismissal where the teacher will have a device, a touchscreen device that is connected to Aries. So the emergency contacts are automatically like populated into the system and the teacher can just touch who the student went home with. And that, you know, 
doesn't require parents to take a pen and sign anybody out. So that's another um, protection that we're putting in place to make sure that we are keeping the spread low. All right. Next slide. Another safety um, procedure or I guess opportunity that we have is, you know, for students or I'm sorry, for families who are not comfortable having their students come back in person, um, even for the blended learning, we also have the online academy that gives our families an option. So they can continue to keep their children in distance learning once we do come back. And so that's another opportunity that we have for our families to keep them, uh, to keep their children safe if they choose to. And then I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Downey. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, mm -hmm. So next slide, please. Uh, board members, as you're aware, on October 28th in our board meeting, uh, the board adopted this planned return to in-person learning that would include on January 11th, our TK through six SDC students, our TKK students and our preschool students returning for in-person instruction in our blended learning model. And on January 19th, our first through sixth grade students returning for blended learning. However, um, as you plan, there's a saying, uh, life happens. So I'd like to update you on some information we received from Governor Newsom uh, this week. Next slide, please. And uh, Governor Newsom updated the blueprint for a safer economy, which again is the umbrella for COVID-19 support from the state of California. Uh, next slide. So. On Monday, November 16th, Governor Newsom and state public health officials announced immediate actions to help slow the spread of the coronavirus. He stated that he was exercising an emergency break to address, address the spread. So with this action, the state moved 28 counties, including Orange County, back into tier one or the purple widespread category due to increased cases of COVID-19. So per the Orange County Healthcare Agency, schools that have not reopened for in-person instruction will have to remain in distance learning until further notice. So as a district, we will continue to monitor the guidance from the state. We will monitor the COVID-19 data for Anaheim and our commitment is that there will be a priority and a focus on the health and safety of our staff, students, and community. And we will communicate any changes in calendar to stakeholders as soon as possible. Uh, next slide. This map gives an illustration to our stakeholders about the severity of the rise in COVID-19. As you can see, the overwhelming majority of counties across California have reverted to purple with few exceptions. And based on the areas that are purple, it's our understanding that more than 90% of students across the state fall into one of these counties based on their resident. Um, next slide. So uh, board members, uh, before concluding, what I like to say is we will continue to provide updates to you. It is our plan in our December uh, meeting to address COVID-19 in our school reopening, to monitor where our county is in terms of the tier system, and to continue to communicate with our stakeholders about our planned reopening. We also stand ready to meet early in January following winter break to also see where we are and to take any actions necessary. Um, at this time, uh, per the Orange County Healthcare Agency, we are not to reopen because of our purple tiered uh, presence for the Orange County. And again, we will continue this process and continue to work with stakeholders. It is our intent to share this presentation uh, as well as information about the reversion back to the purple tier 
with stakeholders tomorrow in our family letter that will be shared uh, across our district. So uh, board members, at this time, we welcome any questions or comments that you might have regarding this matter. Thank you so much, Dr. Downing, and thank you so much, Cabinet, the whole entire uh, reopening committee. Incredibly proud uh, of all the work. Uh, board members at this time, do you have any questions or comments? I just wanted to uh, maybe bring up if we could clarify with stakeholders the the what needs to happen for us to even consider opening again, right? So you stated that because we're in purple, we're not going to open, but uh, maybe uh, inform, may clarify, I'll clarify if you could uh, even, uh, I, my understanding is that you we need to go into the red tier again for two weeks straight or 14 days before it can be considered. Um, is that correct? And if correct. so, if you could, we can make sure that let families know that. I just It came to me as the presentation was going. Excellent, thank you. I just wanted to comment and say, uh, Dr. Downing, you, uh, you talked about the life happens phrase. Uh, I think you guys are doing a great job, uh, you and your team, Dr. Downing. Of, uh, another saying came to mind of hoping for the best, preparing for the worst. So uh, I think that um, you know, you're doing everything that you can to protect our families, our students, our community. Um, some of these decisions that have been made this week are, are kind of uh, above our pay grade, so we're abiding by them the best that we can and really don't have much of a choice in this situation. But uh, I think it's important that the families know whatever the eventuality occurs that we do come back, that we're, we stand prepared to do so. Uh, but as Board Clerk Alvarez mentioned, it's equally important that we communicate to our families that uh, because people hear dates and they look at their calendar and there's always going to be the panic alarms that go off for them. And so we need to make sure that we're communicating that to them. And I know that you're going to be doing that. But just to emphasize that, it's going to probably get lost for some people anyway. But I just want to make that announcement again that um, there is not the inevitable opening anytime soon because it is until further notice. So mm -hmm. that's the important thing, I think, the takeaway to remember. Um, and hopefully we're all uh, remembering that as we move forward. So thank you, Dr. Downing, for everything you do. And thank you, your team. And, and thank you for the, the board members who are on the reopening committee for um, providing your input as well. Um, and all the other uh, committee members who spend you know, hours of their time meeting. I know that uh, we've had several recent meetings and those will continue as well, I imagine. So thank you for your the work you've done and advance in advance of the work you're going to be doing so thank you yes um if i could uh, board president I, again, yeah. I, just, I just want to commend our team um and that includes not only our cabinet members and our directors the teachers who are putting it on the line every day our, our office staff who are there at our schools um, our bus drivers uh, everyone across the district who continue to work on behalf of our families. What we want to say is we are preparing. So when it is safe to reopen, uh, we want everyone to be confident that Anaheim Elementary School District, amazing AESD, will be ready and our stakeholders will be safe. Thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well said, Dr. Downing. <laughs> All right. Uh, Trustee Ruelas, did you have your hand up? No. No, I just gave a thumbs up in the sense, um, like, you know, the communication has been fantastic. And uh, I agree with um, Clerk Alvarez that basically it would be good to make sure that our community is aware of what that means in order to go to the red zone. You know what I mean? Like, what, what exactly does that look like? And it's not just a day, it's two weeks. And even then, you know, um, so just, I just really encourage you to continue with that uh, excellent communication that you've been doing. And um, it would be fantastic um, as uh, um, Alvarez suggested to uh, include that as well. So thank you. Thank you. Trusty Philbeck. Well, I was just gonna ask Dr. Downing, um, I attended a webinar today through Children's Hospital of Orange County, some very um, important information. 
and it was basically, you know, since we're offering information and, and, and giving this um, data out to our families, are we doing anything? The webinar was on how to prevent the holidays from becoming super spreaders. Mm. And there was some very, very good advice, even down to things I hadn't considered, like use only disposable plates, utensils, and cups, and avoid or be careful of the potlucks. You know, um, limit the indoor exposure. There, there was a whole presentation on it. Are we able to offer any of this, these suggestions? Since we're going to be putting this information out, it sounded like tomorrow or within this week. Could could we offer some of the advice that's um, that that's being given as far as to try to prevent the holidays from being super spreaders? We definitely can, um, and we will. Uh, I can share that. I can share the presentation. I would appreciate that. Great. We will great include idea. our communication. I think that's a great idea. Uh, just if I could, there's also been a travel advisory issued from the state as well as a gathering advisory so we would also link that information in our i community. think a lot of this was based on that because they specifically mentioned consider how your guests are traveling whether they're flying in whether uh the same family is coming in the same car or different cars because people can be asymptomatic so that was it sounds like what i listened to mirrors quite you know similarly what you're discussing, but I, I really would like us to at least get this information um, to our our families, our community, in the hopes that it might give everybody a little bit of, you know, um, think about it, even just think about it, you know, be careful of your communal chip and dips and veggies, you know, and just things that you, you take for granted <laughs> that, that right now, um, maybe just even somebody mentioning it or us giving, giving the information might be helpful. So couldn't hurt. So I was just hoping that maybe we could include that for upcoming holidays. Yes. And especially Great idea, trustee Philbeck. I was just going to say, especially if you have a presentation, I do. Uh, if you could share that with me, I'll make sure that it's translated in our languages so that when it goes out, it's accessible to all. Uh, usually they get it to me within a few days. Um, it is the Children's Hospital of Orange County, but I have to give a shout out and thank you also to Kurt Pringle and Associates because they are the ones that have been uh, organizing these uh, webinars every month and with extremely um, valuable content, information, and subjects, uh, different ones. And so I will reach out to them because I think I've attended every single one. So I'll reach out and get you that um, information and I will forward it to you tomorrow. Thank you. And um, we could also work with Dr. Grace, uh, who could Great. assist with that. Yeah, Thank usually you. they send it to me, but it might not be for a day or so, but that would be awesome. And I think just speak to Amanda. Uh, okay. She's usually the one that organizes it. So thank you. Thank you. All right, board members, any other questions? Thank you very much. All right, moving on to eight, consent calendar. Items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and are acted on by the board in one motion. There is no discussion of these items unless a member of the board, staff, or the public requests specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. So at this time, board members, any items of poll? All right, hearing none, uh, can I get a motion? So moved, Rellis. So moved. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion? Hearing none, board roll call vote. Uh, Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on <clears throat> to our action calendar. Superintendent's office it is recommended the Board of Education accept nominations for the California School Boards Association Delegate Assembly for Region 15. CSBA delegates serve two-year terms. Those elected in 2021 will be serving beginning April 1, 2021 through March 31st, 
2023. Now note that board member Phil Beck was elected in 2019 and is currently serving a two-year term through March 31st, 2021. Can I get a motion? So moved. So moved by Trustee Alvarez. Alvarez. Can I get a Alvarez. second? Can I get a second? Yeah. Ruelas. Second by Trustee Ruelas. All right, let's discuss this. Um, first of all, is anybody interested? I think it's just like we nominate, right? You know, Dr. Alvarez Ruelas, is not interested. As, yep. uh, as tempting as you made it sound in that rousing introduction, uh, I'm going <laughs> to pass. So, but thank okay. you. It sounded exciting. Trustee Ruelas, are you interested? All right. And Trustee Phil Beck, you're already serving uh, for another year. That's correct. Thank you so much for your service. Well, no, I actually have to, I would need to re, re oh. up or reapply. Uh, I believe the, for okay. anyone, for anyone who's interested, uh, January 7th, I believe is the deadline for the paperwork okay. that is required to run. And so should I want to go to another term, I would have to do that or any of us would. Um, I, okay. I have only served one term and it's, it's been a really different year this year. You know, the first year I was able to go to the actual session in, in uh, Sacramento and such. And now this year's pretty much been all virtual. So I, I think I will go try to go for another term. Okay. Um, to get in, hopefully into a more normal, uh, you know, term with actually experiencing the, um, you know, everything that happens. But you do also, if anybody is interested, okay. there are other fun no, things no. you do okay. too. Like you, so, you Dr. Get to Downing, judge for I... um, the Golden Bell Awards. You get to, I mean, okay. um, you know, work on that. So it's not just CSBA. There's There's different things. If anybody's interested, there's some kind of fun stuff that goes with it too. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that information. So at this time, do I, do we nominate Jackie Philbeck? Yes. Yeah, so do I say I nominate interest. Jackie Philbeck? Yes. Isn't, okay. Is, well, so I, so, did you ask uh, Juan though? No? Nobody else is interested. Not interested. In interested. Jackie Thank Philbeck. you. Okay. <laughs> so I, so on, I nominate, so I nominate Jackie Philbeck to continue okay. her term in the CSBA. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. All right. <laughs> uh, Thank well, you, guys. Vote, right? The end of the discussion. Uh, so, vote, roll call, vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. <laughs> Trustee Philbeck. Oh, wait, uh, you abstain, right? I, I suppose I should. Yeah, I'll abstain. I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, Trustee Lopez. A very enthusiastic aye. <laughs> All right. Thank, you. Thank you, Mark. Aye. All right, I vote I as well. Congratulations. Uh, we are very proud of you uh, to continue more terms with the CSBA. Thank you, Trustee Philbeck. Thank you. All right, moving on to two. It is recommended the Board of Ed receive the draft January 2021, June 2022 board meeting schedule for the first reading revisions. The final schedule will be brought for approval at the December 16, 2020 annual organizational board meeting. Can I get a motion? So moved, Alvarez. Second. Moved Trustee Alvarez, can I get a second? Seconded by Trustee Rellis. Discussion. Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Rellis. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. Moving on to three. It is recommended the Board of Ed approve an agreement between this district and Cintas First Aid and Safety. At 4320 East Mariloma Avenue, and I'm California 92807 to provide FA, CPR, AED training to district employees. The fee for the service shall not exceed $10,500. Can I get a motion? So moved. Rellis. So moved by Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a second? Second, Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. That's fine. Discussion. Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Rellis. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to B, Ed Services, there is none. Moving on to C, Selpa, there is also none. Moving on to D, Human Resources. It is recommended the Board of Education approve and ratify the new job description 
and recruitment for school safety assistant. This position shall be on range one of the classified salary schedule. Can I get a motion? So move, Philbeck. So second. moved by Trustee Philbeck. Can I get a second? <clears throat> Seconded by Trustee Ruelas. Uh, discussion. I had uh, just a quick uh, question for the superintendent. Uh, just given our our current reality and the discussion we just had about our reopening, uh, in a practical sense, uh, how will this how will this work? Can you just reconcile that for us on how it's going to work as far as our reopening? Certainly. Um, you know, as stated during the presentation, we are preparing for reopening. Uh, these positions will assist with things like. Uh, bus stops, uh, maintaining social distancing. When students are riding on the bus, uh, same thing. They would help screen students that are walking onto the campus. So it is our intent to uh, go through a hiring process, hire this staff to begin the training. Uh, they would participate in the CPR and AED training so that when we reopen, they have the skill set necessary to support this position. Thank you. Thank you. So if, if I may, Chris, or Dr. Downing, a follow-up question. So let's say they get all this training and everything, and then we don't go back. I mean, hmm. what then? I mean, are we still paying them for doing what? Well, if I could, um, our intent is to <clears throat> hire internally. <laughs> So this position is taking our existing campus supervisor position and um, providing a new position that's more aligned to the circumstances that are in place now. Um, as a reminder, we do have our YMCA daycare program going on at all of our schools. So there are a limited number of students at every site uh, we are also uh, working with Anaheim Union High School District to provide uh, meal service. Uh, there are grab and go that are being uh, hosted at our schools. So there are duties uh, that the staff can, once they are uh, onboarded with the training, can begin immediately. Thank you. Trustee Philbeck? Oh, no, sorry. No, <laughs> Usually sorry. when the mic is yeah, off, yeah. I assume that someone's going to share something. Sorry, I know, I apologize, I forgot to do it. <laughs> All right, anybody else want to discuss this item before we vote? All right, hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Wallace. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on. To two, it is recommended the Board of Ed approve the revised job description for curriculum specialist to emergent bilingual support. This position will remain on range 11 on the certificated credential salary schedule based on the on 202 days effective November 19, 2020. Can I get a motion? So moved, Alvarez. So Second. moved by Trustee Alvarez. Second by Trustee Ruelas. Uh, discussion. Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. Moving on to D3. It is recommended the Board of Ed approve the revised job description for coordinator of multilingual language instructional programs. This position will remain on range 12 of the cert. Certificated credential salary schedule based on 202 days effective November 19, 2020. Can I get a motion? So moved. Relis. So moved by Trustee Relis. Can I get a second? Second, Lopez. Seconded by Trustee Lopez. Discussion. Hearing none. Board roll call vote. Tr board roll call vote. Trustee Relis. <laughs> Aye. Uh, Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Uh, Trustee Lopez. Aye. Uh, Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5-0. We are on to four now. It is recommended the Board of Education approves the appointment and contract of employee number 111 
820-20-01 to the position of Assistant Superintendent of Administrative Services, effective November 19, 2020. And I'm going to go ahead and move this motion. Can I get a second? Second. Rellis. Second and Trustee Ruelas. Can I get a discussion? Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Ruelas. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Board Clerk Alvarez. Aye. I also give an enthusiastic aye. Passes 5-0. Dina. Congratulations to AESD's new Assistant Superintendent Administrative Services, Jesse Chavaria. Jesse began working. Yay! I'm not muted, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse began working in AESD in 1999 and has since had many different experiences. Teacher, teacher on special assignment, vice principal, principal, director of transportation, and for the last 10 weeks, acting assistant superintendent administrative services. Congratulations to Jesse as he officially begins this position tomorrow. All right, Congratula congratulations, Jesse. Uh, we look forward to continue our work with you and great job so far. Uh, please. I just want to say uh, thank you to the board. Thank you to Dr. Downing and the entire cabinet team. I know they've been embraced me and kind of helped me and supported me in the last 10 weeks. But ultimately, you know, nothing gives me more pride and I'm very humble to support our AESD family in this new capacity. And given the current situation that we're facing, being able to support not just the, the ASD family, but our community as well. Many of you know that many of my nieces and nephews attend our district, right? Both, you know, Anaheim Elementary as well as Anaheim Union. And many of my extended family members actually are part of the community as well. So nothing, you know, I do have a lot of eyes looking upon me to make sure that I do a great job besides the board, but I want to thank you for that, this opportunity. Thank you. All right, moving on to E, E1, Administrative Services. It is recommended the Board of Ed adopt resolution number 2020-21-21, declaring its intent to grant a public utility and telecommunications easement to the city of Anaheim to facilitate the construction process at Roosevelt Elementary School. Can I get a motion? So move, Phil Beck. Second, so Alvarez. Move by, so moved by Trustee Phil Beck, second by Trustee Alvarez. Uh, discussion. Uh, I had a, a quick question on this. Uh, when we talk about the adjustment, is this uh, that we are, this is just a, the easement that we're, we're getting from the city, right? We just, we discussed on the tour. I'm going to have our assistant superintendent address that. Yeah, okay. the, the, the item that you're looking at <laughs> right now, the first resolution is more for the city to be able to come actually onto our site at Roosevelt to actually service our utility work once we are all completed. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, board members? Nope, board discussion. Uh, all right, board roll call vote. Trustee Wellis. Aye. Trustee Philbeck. Aye. Trustee Lopez. Aye. Trustee Alvarez. Aye. I also vote aye. Passes 5 0. All right. E2. It is recommended the Board of Ed adopt resolution number 2020 22, making a minor adjustment per Ed Code section 17386 to an easement right of way at Sunkiss Elementary School granted to the city of Anaheim at the April 1, 2020 board meeting. Can I get a motion? So moved, Rallis. So moved by Trustee Rallis. Can I get a second? Second, Philbeck. Seconded by Trustee Philbeck. Discussion. <clears throat> Hearing none, board roll call vote. Trustee Rallis? Aye. Trustee Philbeck? Aye. Trustee Lopez? Aye. Our board clerk, Alvarez? Aye. I also vote aye, passes 5-0. Moving on to 10A, board discussion, board member activities related to school business. Let's go ahead and begin with Trustee Ruelas. 
Um, besides my continued efforts to try and join every single PTSA, um, moving along, um, not much else. Um, I just want to just give a shout out to Dr. McAllis and say that I look forward to serving with you for at least two more years. That concludes my report. <laughs> Thank you so much, Trustee Ruelas. I appreciate that. Moving on to Trustee Philbank. Hi, I'm going to try to just power through this. Um, I did stop by Madison after our, our last board meeting. Actually, I was doing some things for you, Dr. McAllis, on a Saturday or a Friday or Saturday, and I saw that they were having a great goodie bag giveaway um, that the YMCA was sponsoring and a lot of Disney things and, and it was great. So I'll just lead into that. We have had a YMCA meeting also. I want to um, just let everybody know that our Kids Now campaign is going on, which is funding that supports many activities that benefit the children that we serve and their families. So just to let you know that our virtual community breakfast is going to be January 8th at eight in the morning and John Dalem. Um, so he was my, he was a coach when I went to Luera and he was also, I believe I took psychology from him. He's going to be the keynote speaker and I would advise, um, you don't want to miss this because he's one of those mountain climbers. He's climbed Everest, you know, so many times, I don't know, all, like all over the world who's climbed mountains. Great, It'll be greatly motivational. And our YMCA gala, which was canceled last year, is a major fundraiser, um, uh, roaring into 2021 now. And we will hopefully be having this at the new Anaheim family, YMCA's uh, new community complex, hopefully uh, Saturday, April 10th at uh, next year at 6 p.m. The event is happening, whether in person or virtual. So I just kind of want to give everybody a heads up on that, that, you know, we're moving forward in the YMCA and, and we're just excited about it and stick with us and help us. Um, I did stop by Lincoln just quickly yesterday to, for the COVID testing. I didn't end up getting tested because they, I hit a wrong time. They were closing uh, for lunch and there was actually quite a few people there. So the lot, the wait was going to be a, a bit, but I thought it was very organized, well run from what I could see. So um, kudos, congratulations. It's, it's our, our school sites are, it, I think it's a big help for the community that this is happening and correct me, please. Latino health, um, Dr. Downing, who is our partner? Yes. Yeah. We're partnering with Latino health access. Access. As well. Okay. The Orange County Healthcare Agency, and we uh, keep the dates and the sites updated on our website, so everyone can visit. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to make sure I said it correctly. Um, appreciation there, and yes, please, everybody, you know, look for those sites, especially when we are coming into this holiday season and stuff. You know, you have you have access to testing. So uh, I already mentioned about the the webinar that um, I attended today that was, you know, just uh, amazing. It was wonderful. Um, and so I'll just mention that the, I think one of the most fun things I got to do was a few days ago, there was a surprise drive through uh, parade or drive by parade for our friend and uh, fellow colleague board member, Bob Gardner. And it was just a lot of fun. Um, it was a big surprise. I kind of found out last minute. And let me tell you, there was an army of cars. You would have thought it was just like, well, he is he is pretty important. So, um, and obviously loved. And everybody was giving him signs and balloons. I gave him his favorite pie. So I think I kind of won that. But um, he was, you know, to give him his pie. But it was a lot of fun. And it was really great to see him and Jenny and so Bob or Jenny if you're listening we love you and uh, Bob looks good so uh, the PTAs I joined were Gower, Henry and Marshall recently um, I'm making my way through them and I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to um, everyone even in this rough rough year we can all have a season of, of gratitude we can all have that before us and try to live in that um, and get your flu shots with that. Mm. I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you so much. Trustee Philbeck. 
All right, Trusty Lopez. Thank you, Dr. Magalas. Uh, well, looking back at my calendar, I certainly thought I was more busy than I actually was with some of the, the items I had on here. The only uh, thing that I actually attended, I had the intention to go a lot of things, but the only thing I actually did attend was our LCAP virtual meeting uh, two weeks ago, which was, uh, as I recall, another very efficient meeting. Um, I think it was just a quick check-in, and it was only about 20 minutes or so, um, and which helped me with getting my next meeting as well. So. Uh, thank you to our newest uh, assistant soup who did give a, a quick update and presentation and, and got us out of there very efficiently. So thank you, Mr. Chavaria. That's all I have to report. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Trusty Lopez. Board Clerk Alvarez. Thank you, Dr. McAllis. Uh, recently, I attended the school reopening committee. Um, again, like uh, Dr. Downey had mentioned earlier today, fantastic turnout of uh, a variety of different stakeholders. It's always great to see them having conversations and being uh, open to share what they're feeling and, and their, their worries in a forum that everyone uh, feels safe in. So it's uh, really great to see that we're able to communicate with each other and move forward together as we as we figure out what's going to happen with uh, reopening. I also attended uh, Horace Mann School Site Council. Uh, they went through a series of uh, business items where they need to approve different uh, documents for the school to move forward, um, including their SPSA and things like the uh, restorative practices that they're uh, working on through their uniform complaint procedures, things like that. So they're very well organized, very well, uh, uh, well attended by parents and teachers. Um, I also attended a Gower principal chat um, uh, basically, the topic was all the updates on COVID. There was a few uh, parents there asking a few questions. Everything got answered, so it's always great to see that our le our leadership is well informed and they're able to communicate that to our parents. So if, if it's happening in the chats I've been at, I know it's happening everywhere. So I'm really proud of our communication stream from the, uh, uh, Dr. Downing's office all the way down to the parents through uh, different formats. Uh, it's really uh, uh, impressive. So I appreciate all of that. I also want to uh, say. Uh, Congratulations, I'm so proud for Dr. McAllis and uh, Trustee Philbeck for earning a, a four-year term more on, on the board. I'm really happy to see you continue to serve our families and our community. Uh, proud to serve with you for at least two more years, right? So uh, <laughs> congratulations and uh, that's my report. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. Uh, Trustee Alvarez, Trustee Lopez, Trustee Philbeck, uh, Trustee Ruelas, um, I'm very excited to serve another four years. Uh, now, a couple weeks ago, I did also go to a COVID site, uh, Trustee Feldbeck, uh, and but I actually did get tested. Um, and you're right, it was absolutely organized, super quick, um, safe, uh, great, great job, Latino Health Access and OC Healthcare Agency. Extremely proud to partner with y'all on helping our community safe during this time. Uh, Trustee Philbeck, thank you also for uh, attending the school reopening committee for me in last uh, month. I, I'm so appreciative. Uh, you know, it was a crazy month uh, and uh, I don't know if I can say why, but uh, um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I did attend the last uh, school reopening committee. Great job to, uh, again, uh, to our superintendent, Dr. Downing, our cabinet, and all the stakeholders and members who are a part of that committee. I'm so proud of everyone. Such hard work, such changing times. Um, and oh, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it on the December 9 meeting. Uh, but uh, please, everyone, stay safe. Wear a mask. Uh, I know these are difficult times, but we'll get through this together. Uh, I love you all. I'm praying for everyone in the community, and 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 thanks for all those recommendations, uh, Trustee Philbeck. Everybody, uh, it's time to share uh, ways that we could all be safe. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I love the paper plate idea. I'll do that. Uh, I'm meeting with my family, just very small as well, small pods. But yeah, let's just keep promoting it. It's going to be a new time in our nation's history. And I know there's been a lot of division, but it's now time to come together and work together, just like our board has been doing. And I'm so proud to have served with you all these last four years uh, and to serve another four years. It's time to rebuild. Uh, we can do this together. Si se puede. Uh, and with that said, let's move on to our future agenda items. Board members, do we have any future agenda items you would like to add? 
Trustor Ellis, no? Okay, hearing none, then I adjourn this meeting at approximately 9, 16 p.m. Have a great evening, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, Hello, everyone. Be safe. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a great break. Congratulations, Happy Jesse. Everybody. Congrats. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.